tell everyone my, my um, method here with the department heads is I tell them to please tell me what all of your perceived needs are, what you think you really need. Um, I, this year I asked them to include all of their capital requests, even those that at that point we weren't sure, but we thought we'd probably have grant money for. Um, so the number came in at a 14.75% increase over the previous year, um, mostly for those reasons. Our budget pressures this year, what's driving our budget, there are inflationary increases, significant increase in our paramedic service, a shortfall, a shortfall in the medical fund, which is really the purview of the Board of Finance, not the Board of Selectmen, um, and school bonding, which also is, is under the purview of the Board of Finance. So the first thing I'll talk about today is the capital budget. Um, and typically one of the first things that I do when I'm um, preparing the budget is I go through all of our unappropriated cap and non funds to see if there are any projects that can be closed out. Um, so this year we were able to close out quite a bit of um, individual projects. Um, we also got some grant reimbursements that also went into the unappropriated cap and non. Um, so we started with a healthy balance there. Um, there are some capital expenditures that um, the Board of Selectmen determined were necessary this year um, that totaled $772,070 um, and we are able to fund all of those through um, unappropriated cap and non and cap and non revenue streams. So that leaves a balance of 86,000 in unappropriated cap and non, which is uh, higher than we left it. I always like to try to leave that higher, that number higher than where we left it. Okay. So we also made quite a few reductions in our capital and non-recurring um, expenditure requests. Um, many of them were just removed and deferred to another year. Um, some of them uh, we determined we had existing funds um, to pay for them. Uh, a couple were duplicates um, with it, other parts of the budget. Um, and some were funded either by grants or surplus. So we were able to um, remove approximately a million dollars from our capital request. The pressures on our um, operating budget, um, mostly inflationary, um, so contracted <coughs> services in public works, particularly cleaning services and our tree contract. Um, these are companies that had held their prices for us for a long time. Um, the tree contract, it's kind of interesting, the, uh, many of the trees that were damaged in the 2018 storm are now dying. So the public works director has added um, funds to that tree service just because we know we have trees that we are going to need to take down. Um, road repair, we're trying to, again, get ahead of that. Um, and our paramedic contract <coughs> did increase by um, almost $300,000. Um, this did go out to bid this year. Um, there were no bidders. Uh, so we are, um, New Vans agreed to provide service for us, um, but they have had a significant increase in their labor costs. Um, there's a shortage of paramedics in the state, so um, we're faced with that increase. Um, <clears throat> there were also two um, additional appropriations which were approved by um, the Board of Finance and Town Meeting, one to add a permanent SRO in the elementary school, the other um, for additional staffing in the communication center. So on the operating side, we were able to make some reductions um, also um, in, in individual departments. Um, if you see the last line, the police on the Bottom line, um, we had budgeted 
Well, after we had prepared our budget, we received an estimate from the state police um, on what our bill will be for the next fiscal year. We budgeted $200,000 higher than what their, re their request was. Um, and that was due to a difference in pay grade for two new tro troopers um, and also a change in their fringe benefit rate, a decrease in their fringe benefit percentage that uh, we pay. So um, Olga and I were not comfortable taking out the entire $200,000 just because those are two elements that could change and we want to have we want to be prepared for that so we took a um, hundred thousand out of that line um, so uh, in total we were able to reduce the operating budget by approximately two hundred and seven thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars um, which brings our total reduction over just about a million and a half um, to an increase um, in that budget, in the operating budget and the cap and non, um, to 3.85%. Um, I just have one chart left, and I, this is in your budget binders. This is a comparison between last year's budget and this year's budget. And what this does is it brings um, the non-tax revenue um, and the interest income and cap and non um, into the picture. So yes, we had expenditure increases that were due to inflation. We also have increases in our interest income due to inflation. And when you look um, at the bottom line, um, the total that the town is asking for um, in, from taxpayers um, only increased by $35,707, or 0.32%. Um, so you know we have the interest income balancing our inflationary pressures. Um, obviously, we've made some other reductions, and um, we're not asking for any contribution from taxpayers to capital. Um, <clears throat> so, in reality, our budget is fairly flat. And uh, that is all I've got. You're done. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a chance we could get a copy of that? Yes, I can. I will email it to everyone. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kat. Mm -hmm. my, my first comment that is, is this is a this is a different way we've we've seen it presented, and it uh, yeah. it uh, does make it a little clearer. Okay. That, um, that chart is in your budget binder. That is in the It binder. is one of the standard, um, it's the comparison year. <clears throat> you know which page number of the uh, 200 yes, pages it's, it is? Yeah, the, yeah. In the binder, the structure is basically the first few pages. That's where you will see the summary. Um, you know, it starts with the top sheet, uh, the impact of both budgets on the mill rate as presented. Then it follows by the total comparison from year to year. Then it follows by... Um, just town budget comparison, and that's one of the slides would be this, and then it follows by Board of Education. So basically all it does is that uh, it incorporates revenue section against the expenditures. And yes, this, this, was, this page is always included. It was always included oh, in the prior binders as well. Um, so the binder starts with overall comparison, total budget, followed by municipal, and then followed by Board of Education budget, and then the first section is municipal budgeting details. That's where you will find department presentations and the historical spend from yeah. departments, and then it follows by Board of Education detailed budget. Okay, we'll hold our questions for and after public comment. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, that was short and to the point. Thank you. Let's, uh, we'll now go to the public comment section of the meeting. Uh, so if you would like to make a comment, you go to the podium and just give us your name and let us hear your comment. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Millie Kellogg, Rock Ridge Court. Um, you know, with inflation the way it is, 
I think Pat has done a wonderful job with his budget. Thank you. Who's next? No comments too bad, no questions too bad, so... Uh, well, you just... Keep it. <laughs> just, just for the public, we're, the Board of Finance does meet every Wednesday during the month of March. And for the next two meetings, for the most part, it's, we've already scheduled it to be Zoom meetings. So as far as the public, if you're here and you see all of our faces, this is your opportunity to let us, to let the Board of Selectmen have it as far as comments or like Millie Kellogg said, uh, compliments. So this is it. After this, we're going to go back to Zoom. So, For a you, while, can, right? so you can hide from the neck down. <laughs> <laughs> No more public comment? <clears throat> okay, based on our agenda, we're going to have to, we will stick with our uh, recess time at uh, 1030. So we have, thank you, Claudia. We have an hour, <laughs> we have an hour and 10 minutes. No other public comment. Going once, going twice, I don't have a gavel. Going three times. Oops. Yeah, I get it. Did I did I, did I beg enough? Uh, my name's Don Kellogg. I also live at Rockridge Court with Millie. Um, I I mean, I, I, there's really not much to say about this budget. It, a thirty-five thousand dollar increase uh, in the conditions that we're experiencing is is outstanding, um, in my opinion. Um, what I want to say is that. Last year's budget cycle was very difficult. Um, you are elected to represent us. And I urge you this year, you take true consideration of the input that you're receiving. Ultimately, the budget is our decision, not yours. And when you hear over and over and over again that we want this budget to vote on, I really urge you to, t to heed that. That's your responsibility, is to, is to give us our opportunity to vote on these budgets. And I feel like last year, it, it took too much to get to that point. We had been asking for it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And finally, you know, thanks to Mark, we figured out a way to, to move this forward. But when you hear that input from the community, it's your responsibility to act on that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Who's next? Okay, going once, going twice. Sold. Okay, it's back to us. Does anybody want to lead off with uh, a question or a comment or two on this? All right, let me, uh, let me start. Uh, let me go back again, Pat. You said, isn't the, the major increase this year or for the next fiscal year really due to the medical? The M I don't mean the medical. Paramedic. Yeah. Paramedic. Yeah. Paramedic. Yeah. That is, that is was something really beyond your control, but the number that you have, is that subject to, that could increase, or is that number locked in? That's the, the, um, the latest number from the hospital. It was adjusted once. I don't, uh, they knew we were using that as a placeholder for our budget, so I think that is as close as they could be at the time. I don't expect it to change significantly, um, unless Olga has heard otherwise from the hospital. I don't believe that will change significantly. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mom. Go ahead. So are we being billed per call, or are we being billed per hour for service? Um, you know, I don't have the budget yet. That will come as part of the contract. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that we are billed for the service. So we have those paramedics on site 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we're, the, the cost is derived. 
not per call. Okay. Correct, Olga? I, mean, I would maybe... assume so, yes. And during our talks, of course, because they provide staffing for us. They don't respond to the calls. You right. know, they provide staffing to the town to respond to the calls. So mm -hmm. what we will, what we're going to be moving to, um, because of right now the volatility um, of the costs to provide the service, what the hospital is, is moving towards is um, preparing a budget for the towns that use their services. Um, and that is what our bill is going to be based on. Um, so we will have a budgetary breakdown from them, is my understanding. How many people is this budget covering? Uh, what's New Mass providing us in terms of number of people? Um, we have <coughs> two paramedics um, on call 24-7-365. So, um, so, that so there are going to get a hundred twenty thousand dollar increase each. That seems extravagant. Well, no, there are other things that are built into that increase. It's not solely labor, but well, labor but is what has the driven ambulance. the yeah. increase. Mm -hmm. And and I haven't gotten the budget from them yet, broken down. Okay. So um, uh, it sounds like an area that we'll need to dig into a little more. Well, honestly, Dave, we have no option. We have no leverage. <laughs> so there's a there's a um, monopoly uh, situation going yeah. on. So. Leverage is down, absolutely. And Dave, I will tell you that I did reach out to, to our state rep to say Danbury Hospital New Vance is a not-for-profit entity. Right. Is there a way for us to have our billable town rate overall looked at? Because they're the only game in town. Yeah, when something, you something doesn't seem right. You get an ambulance and our paramedics and EMTs and firefighters are amazing. <laughs> and our equipment costs, I mean, the stretcher for that ambulance winds up being close to $25,000. An ambulance used to cost $180,000. we are up close to $400,000 for an ambulance. And you have to wait a year like the other um, vehicles that you've heard about in town. So it, it's very difficult to do that. And I asked um, Pat Callahan and uh, um, Steve. Steve, Steve to take a look at this. And they were going to pull in Julie to see whether or not that Danbury, our new Vance, as a not-for-profit, whether or not there would be room for them to have uh, our our billing rates, because we're not the only town that's over the battle with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the, the option in my mind, since apparently no one is willing to get on this contract, mm -hmm. um, is <clears throat> we do it ourselves, and we figure out how we can get uh, the medical personnel we would need. So we, uh, we but did, I realize that used to be done and is no longer done, and there was a reason for that well, switch. Well, there, so. there. So we, yes, we don't have enough volunteer staff to to provide coverage. I don't think we coverage, can do it volunteers. Actually. But um, even I know Olga, we've done those calculations to try to see if this is in the ballpark, or you know, it, mm -hmm. it, would there be room if we could even find personnel to do it? And this is still a more reasonable option. So even with these numbers. Um, we still feel that you know this is a financially the best thing to do. I think if you look at the because um, this number really bothered me and um, but I I sort of came to terms with it by if if you look at the number of hours um, two people twenty four hours a day three hundred sixty five days a year yeah. and divide it into the total. We're going to pay a little over, just a little over $60 an hour, I think it is, per person, per man hour, person hour. And um, for a fully loaded medic EMT with Benny's in this labor environment, that's not terrible, um, especially given what they have to pay paramedics now uh, with the shortage that exists. If you can uh, even get them. Yeah, yes. if, if, you can, if you can get them. Because I'm not a particular fan of um, Nuvance, uh, mm -hmm. because they do have monopoly. And, uh, but um, as I looked at it that way, I thought, you know, that's, that's not, unre that's not unreasonable. And I don't think that we could do it ourselves 
less expensive than 60 bucks an hour fully loaded well, in this labor market? Nor could we only hire four people. Right. So, you know, right. we, we, it becomes a situation where we have to have enough people on staff to be able to make up for vacations, illness, mm -hmm. um, whatever. Um, and it's, it's a very similar to situation to our dispatch center. So it, it, like I said, we did go through those calculations initially to see where, you know, get a feel for where we were. Um, we still think this is reasonable. I think uh, one of the things that could be done, but it, it certainly can't be done for this fiscal year, is that we could start to look at the, with a monopoly like that mm -hmm. at the hospital, we could start to look at the whole emergency medical system as a region, mm -hmm. as opposed to town by town by town, uh, yeah. because um, while we may have, I think now we're up to about 1,200 calls a year, um, some, some, something in that mm -hmm. vicinity, right, Rich? And um, the um, so eh, three or so a day. Um, and you think, well, you got yep. two people sitting around mm -hmm. all the rest of the time, mm -hmm. and there's definitely some, there's definitely got to be some places where um, regionalization might make more sense. But in order to get regionalizing town services, you have to let municipalities kind of come to that very slowly on their own because Connecticut is so provincial mm -hmm. in terms of everybody wants to do everything in town. Yeah. And, and we don't want to spread our services out so far that the, um, like that the ambulance would be located in a place that would take too long to mm -hmm. get to the farthest mm -hmm. reaches right. of our town. Like, so for example, <coughs> for a while, when we, when we first started having difficulty with getting enough volunteers, we did what was called a paramedic intercept, and the paramedic mm -hmm. sat mm -hmm. at Danbury Hospital, came and m met our ambulance uh, partway. The ambulance <laughs> pick up people, then mm -hmm. they'd stop like around the queue or someplace like that. The medic would drop, hop on board, Some a volunteer would jump out of the ambulance, drive the medic's car and so forth just to get that higher level of service that we weren't able to provide with a, a paramedic. Um, but if you have a, a, an ambulance coming out of Danbury Hospital and you've got a call in Candlewood Hills, that you, you, you know the golden five minutes or the golden mm -hmm. two minutes or whatever, you're, you're never gonna make it in time. You're not gonna provide the kind of service that the people of this town deserve to have. So, um, I think it's a bigger issue than just New Fairfield. Uh, it is. It's a statewide issue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but but and and it, and c along with that comes a lot of regulatory change that would have to happen. So right. um, it is something for us to not only keep working with our state delegation, but also with the COG. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. this is an issue that is on the top of the list for our, you know, our uh, municipal associations like CCM and cost um, mm -hmm. for this legislative session. So um, there is an awareness out, out there that there's a problem. Working through the COG is a great idea. Yeah. Um, and um, is this, can I just ask, is this a, um, is this a brand new contract or is this um, an amendment to the existing it's town? a brand new contract. Okay, mm -hmm. and how long will it last? You know, there was, um, we have had preliminary discussions. Um, the budgetary piece will be year to year. Um, it'll be based <laughs> on the, the, um, uh, the budget that they present to us every year. It'll be a different process than what we're used to. Okay. Which I, I think is beneficial, could be beneficial um, to us. But there's yeah. no, okay. I'm sorry. as far as you know, there's not a limit on like cost of living or. No know. limit on the size of increase. Right. We don't have the contract yet, no. so we have not begun negotiating that contract yet. Okay. Okay. You know, what other communities uh, is uh, 
New Vance serving in, in this capacity? Um, off the top of my head, I know they are servicing Bethel. Um, Dan they, uh, well, they provide some services to Danbury, um, a little bit different than um, New Fairfield. Um, Sherman? No, I don't believe no. they service Sherman. Um, Bethel is the one that I know for sure at this moment. Do we know how Sherman is serviced? Uh, I do not know. I don't know if Cheryl, you know. Um, well, New Milford is a Nuvance um, right. hospital, so it's an extension. Um, Sherman has a contract with somebody, and is I'm not Vintec? sure. I, I, I don't, I just don't recall. Yeah. If Bruce was here, he would know right off the top of his yeah. head, but I don't. Re but I, I know that we looked at them from the fire department point of view, and they were bound for the next year or two by whatever contract they have commitments yeah. they had. At that, and I just don't remember who. But you have to remember, Nuvance, they own New Milford now, the hospital, yeah, they, they own Sharon Hospital, they mm -hmm. own Vassar Brothers over mm -hmm. in um, Poughkeepsie, and um, you know, they're, they are becoming a, Duchess. a large medical system, yeah. so. I believe Putnam as well. Putnam, Putnam and Duchess, yeah, and Noah. Um, right. Which is, <laughs> is both, bad and good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it gives them opportunities for some things that have to do with the uh, scale, and, but once you become the only game in town, it takes away a lot of competition, too, so. True. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Pat. Yeah. Um, Pat, are we going to be able possibly to get the breakdown of uh, what has caused the uh, almost $300,000 uh, increase, can we get the breakdown like within the next well, couple of weeks? No, probably not. So that would be helpful. It would be, but the that's part of the contract um, that New Vance is, is um, developing for us. So um, I, I don't think it will, we'll have it within a couple of weeks. Um, the goal is to have the contract before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and I know that they are working on that, but we have not seen the draft from them yet. So the, it's a process that will take a while. I just think it would be interesting to find out who they do service and uh, what rates are being raised in those communities and is there any possible purchasing power by actually having discussions with all the people they're servicing. It's probably not, but it's not quite regionalization, but at least discussions with whoever they're serving and perhaps some ability as a group to put some pressure on those rates, I, I don't know. We've had some of those discussions with them, but they are actually backing away. Um, when we initially um, put this out to bid, the input that we got back was that they, um, this is, was not a money-making proposition for them, so they were, their focus was going to remain on, on Danbury um, and, and not so much the smaller towns. So um, this is new for everybody, the approach that they're taking. Um, this is the, the budgetary approach is what they, I guess, have had with Danbury for quite a while. Hmm. Um, so we, we certainly are having those discussions, Kim. It would be good to find out who all they're servicing. Hmm. I have a question on a couple of other sec sections of the budget. Sure. Is uh -huh. it okay if I move on? Yeah, let's move on from medical. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, on the um, communication center, which we had issues with earlier in the year, um, the last time I think that we talked officially with the Board of Selectmen about the communication center, um, you guys were going to take, mm -hmm. you were going to revisit it in mm -hmm. the January, February t time frame. Have you done that? And where are we with how this new staffing model is working up there? And, and also with the measurements of not just the cost, but 
how fast we're answering calls. And <laughs> so those numbers have been excellent. Um, well over, um, I want to say over 97%. Um, but, and don't quote me on that because I, I can't remember each one of them, but they've been very high. Um, we, we're gathering the information to do that review um, at, at one of our next um, board of selectmen meetings. Okay. We have been successful in um, bringing more part-time dispatchers on okay. staff. Um, I don't know if Olga, you have an update on um, where we are overtime-wise. That, but we we have made significant progress with staffing. So um, my expectation is that things will look better when we do that review. Do you expect then that as if, if, if this budget got approved as you presented for the communication mm -hmm. center, that we would then be able to go through the fiscal year and manage within that number um, and that the chances of needing additional appropriations is, will be pretty low for the coming fiscal year? We have reviewed those numbers um, with, with the dispatch center several times. So yes, right now we do feel comfortable with those numbers. Okay. And then the other um, thing that I wanted to ask is, uh, and some of this goes back to the discussion that we had at our special meeting um, earlier, I guess, this week. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd like, for one of our sessions, I'd, I'd like um, to ask um, the selectmen to prepare a more, I don't know, detailed is, is really what I'm looking for, but I'd like sort of an overview of the five-year capital plan of, I know that we've got stuff in the budget book, but I'd like to hear you guys kind of go through um, we can do that That's this, you know, Cheryl. this is what this is what we the five year window seems to me I mean I I, I totally want to see us try for a longer window but the five year window we should be able to get a fairly decent idea of what we're looking at uh -huh. although we all have seen just in the time that you all have been on the board that things come up that you just absolutely never imagined before and all of a sudden it's there and it's got to be fixed and whatever but i'm going to ask the school the same thing um to to try and get to this issue of um the long term our, our better long term planning so Cheryl, you know that that's been my focus um, right. for the, all the time I've been here in trying to reestablish a, a um, level um, number for our capital over five years. What, unfortunately, what happens is capital is always the first thing that goes. And, and so we are always playing catch up. We always have that hill to climb because capital gets cut in the first year. So if if we aren't going to have the will to stick with the number, um, then that five-year plan, it, it gets thrown out the window. Um, and you know what we have done this year is pretty drastic. I mean, I, I, we removed the plow truck that was in there, which is $273,000, because with the pressure of the medical and the debt and the needs of Board of Ed, we tried to minimize the impact that the town budget would have on the taxpayer. So, you know, just trying to climb those hills in future years, you keep doing that, it just pushes everything off. Um, so it's been rather frustrating, but I will certainly prepare it again. Thank you. And, and sure, oh. sure, along with that, maybe also, I'd like to see the last three years, the initial proposed cap and non before the Board of Selectmen made cuts and then before the Board of Finance made cuts. So we can actually get an idea of, I think there's more than just what's been kicked down the road this year. I think there's been stuff kicked down the road repeatedly, not blaming anyone for that. Like you right. say, if we don't have the guts to pay for it, then that's what happens. 
but I think not only the future, but seeing what happened in the past would be helpful as well. Okay, I, 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 mm -hmm. I, could, I could go for that. I think, I think too, it's important for, it, it took me a long time on this board to understand the nuances of cap and non. So as Pat went through this <laughs> morning, and, and I'm just not sure 100% how clear it is to the general public that there are, there are projects that we put money towards and the town agreed, and then we did those projects, but we didn't spend quite all the money. Mm -hmm. So that money is left over. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to go back to the taxpayer and get more money, but we have to now reappropriate that money to other things. And if they turn out to be part of the same, let's say um, town properties is one of the lines in there. If it turns out to be another part of town properties, well, we don't really have to ask the public, is it okay if we change this? The selectmen just vote to do that. But if you take something that was part of town properties and now you're gonna spend it for public works um, vehicles, well, mm -hmm. Then it, it it does have to go through the budgetary process, but it doesn't necessarily show up as a line item on its own. Then you've got money that so you've got that pot of money that she has for the last two years she has reappropriated mm -hmm. uh, to to various projects in a in a in a very good way that I very much appreciate. Then you've got there are other funds that come into Cap and Non. Mm -hmm. Uh, from boat slips, from the tower <laughs> rental, from other mm -hmm. things that the town has agreed over the year. Here's the revenue that's going to go to cap and non. So that's what we call non-taxpayer revenue. So that comes in there. Those things get allocated, but they don't. They're not increasing our mill rate here. Mm -hmm. So. She's allocated those, and we vote on those as a part of the budget process, but they're less well seen. And then, in past years, we've always had a piece of, this is what we're asking the taxpayers to fund in this particular, that's what's gone to zero this year. As, as Pat has pointed out, that's not a particularly good thing for us to do because it's a hole that for next year, it, it can't stay at zero forever and meet the capital long-term capital needs of the town and the school. And so at some point we'll have to start to fix it, like we're fixing medical this year. Um, but I think it's important for all of us, including the public, to understand all the pieces of capital, what we can do, what we can't do, and what we're leaving on the table that we've got to find spaces for in the future somehow. And, and maybe to brainstorm some ideas of how do you provide a better revenue stream into our capital budget on a regular basis that, um, you know, if for example, in some towns, every year as their debt service goes down, they put the equivalent amount into their cap and non. Mm -hmm. um, the notion being that it, you know, that holds everything equal. And if you're not paying for, if you're not paying for money that you borrowed, you're putting aside money for capital projects that you won't have to borrow. Um, it wouldn't be part of our budget process, but it would be something that we could look at as a, as a working cooperatively with the. Board of Selectmen and uh, Board of Education. So the goal I just would be to have those two numbers work together. Yeah, I just like to see <clears throat> that kind of detail and and have us have a chance to really focus on it and talk about it as a board, and then get to some of the kinds of things that Kim was asking in his big motion the other night. Of um, we've had some we've had we have studies planned for. Mm -hmm. uh, projects like the dam and the, um, mm -hmm. and I, there's no point in doing the study if you already have some idea of how much it's going to cost, so I don't expect them to know what the ultimate cost will be, but if it's over a certain amount, then for sure we're going to have to bond it. Um, I, I wouldn't come to that conclusion, Cheryl, at this moment, and oh. that's why 
you know, those projects, you're right, we don't have a final cost on them. For example, the Senior Center Dam. Um, that, that dam it, right now is not presenting any particular hazard, so we're trying to set money aside to be able to do the work necessary to um, ultimately figure out what the, the resulting construction would look like. Um, <coughs> but whether or not we would bond any of that or what portion oh, okay. we would bond is, is really up in the air. I mean, those are the kind of things that the reason we're looking at them now is that there is federal and state money available for those types of projects. So um, it's really premature to make any assumption that any of those would require bonding. I think the one thing we know for sure, though, um, or maybe we don't, but I'll just throw this out there, is that there was a time in the past when the town bonded and replaced all the roofs on all the town and school buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is now about 20 to 30 years ago, which means it's about at the useful, end of useful life of those roofs. And so in the school plan that Rich Sanzo used to have, he always had this little column that said, roofs were kind of like sitting out there saying, well, don't forget about these, but these aren't in my plan because we can't, they end up costing millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean. I was <laughs> amazed at how much roofs cost for large municipal buildings. Um, so we know that that is going to have to come up at some point in the future. So I think it would be good. I, I, I don't mean to keep beating a dead horse. I, I just, if we could make one of our meetings kind of semi-focused on um, the, the big yeah. cap. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, there's another thing I think this might help. I mean, it's something we can discuss. We usually do capital and non last in the reports. Right. I think maybe every other meeting, do it first. All right, you know what I'm saying. Spend a little more time on it and make sure that um, none of us have any questions, all right, on the future. I would like to see that um, every other month for a while. Put it first. Okay. <clears throat> I think that would be helpful. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Sure, you mentioned capital, but you just the last thing you mentioned was the, uh, the school room. So we would need to look at two capital plans: the town plan and the board of capital. Plan. Yeah, I, I I I would plan to ask that yeah. when the board of ed is up here too. If yeah. they, if, There's um, other things on capital too in the board of ed that yes. we should worry about: the turf field, the tank. The tanks. The tanks. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to ask them the same thing. The Milford just replaced their, you know, school roof. I mean, that was very pricey. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't. We, we, we and we don't want to. We don't want to deal with the same issues that New Milford had. No, no, no. no. no, no. Not that contractor. That's no, for no. sure. <laughs> okay. Any other? Any other questions? Well, issues. I'm, I'm very up. concerned with the growth of departments over time, so I'm going to make a motion that the selectman provides the filing information. Total headcount. Kim, position. you don't need to make a motion. We just ask. You can ask the question. I'd like to make a motion. Well, motion is out of order. Why is just that? ask for the information. Why is that a motion out of order? It's, it's a not on the agenda. Hearing. Motions are not on the agenda. No, it's not on this agenda. This is a public hearing. All you need to do is just like Cheryl asked for. Is this a special for meeting? Ask for the information. Is this a special if, meeting? If you're going to argue. Is this a special so. meeting? I don't think so. It's not a special meeting. It's a public hearing. Well, then the agenda is modifiable. And I, you know, there's often motions at public hearings. But okay, I'll simply ask for it because what's the yeah. difference? You get the same effect. So. Yeah, I get no answers either way. Total headcount and position titles for each department, total cost for salaries and benefits for each department in the 12 13 budget year, the 15 17 budget year, and the currently proposed budget. Within the police department, break out separately the total cost of police officers in the school buildings. If the employee is or was working in more than one department, list the percentage of time for each department and include the proper percentage of the cost for that employee in each department work. List the total cost for salaries and benefits for each department head in the 12-13 budget year, the 16-17 budget year, and the currently proposed budget. What positions, if any, that were listed in the approved 22-23 budget are currently unfilled and for what amount were they budgeted? 
that's some information that I would like to have because again, I think very often this board only focuses on the current budget without any thought to where, what happened last year, what happened two years ago, and very little thought about what will happen in the future, which is why I made those questions about future tax implications of projects that actually could be estimated, you know, not perhaps terribly accurately, but you could certainly say, is our sewer going to cost 10 million, are they going to cost a million, are they going to cost 100 million? That kind of broad range estimate is easily available. Um, so anyway, that's what I would like to see. I don't know if anyone else is interested in that. I'd like to know if anyone else is. Um, Jim, is it fair to say that you're going to send that out in writing to well, the I, board? I, I could, sure. Yeah, certainly. I think that might be a good I mean, I, it's not a motion. I don't know if there's a reason to, but sure. Well, I, well, think I haven't figured out why we didn't get a motion anyway. So. Well, we can have it at the next It's certainly not out of order to make motions. I think any information that any of us need to do this job by statute, by general statute under Board of Finance, we need to have that information. So I, I will point out that that information is available to you. Um, it is in uh, the budget information for every one of those years. Um, this year's information is in your budget binder. You know, if I, were, um, if, I were to, if I were to make up those numbers, they would simply be challenged. So I would like to get a those numbers from people who are paid to provide that information as opposed to us as volunteers going back and trying to look at it and then being challenged because because your professionals will come up with different numbers. And um, as far as those three capital projects, those broad estimates have been incorporated in budgets for years. Therefore, it will be easy to pull the numbers. Mm -hmm. If I Can I make a comment on that mm -hmm. request? Only just to kind of shifts perspective a little bit because um, it's historical data may be of some importance and some analysis. What is important and what the budget represents is the needs of the town for the upcoming year. So as an example, let's say for the discussion of SRO possibly, even if you look at numbers for the SRO you know, from 2013, 2016 and current, yes, the, you know, there's possibly fluctuation. I don't know the history, but what is important is what are the needs of the town for the upcoming fiscal 24? Fiscal year. Do you want to have three SROs or not? It's not clear the to number me of it's, SROs It's not clear to me that it's your position to opine on things like that. It's your position to provide accurate information. It's not your, it's not oh your God, job to Jim. opine. Oh my God, Jim. It's not. It's not I, her. Let her talk. My, it's not her. She should not be opining. She on, is on your financial issues. advisor. I'm advising on your perspective on the budget and how to analyze the numbers no, and what they you're represent. Telling us, you're telling us what you think is important to focus on. And that's not your job. Your job is to provide us with statistics. No, my job is to advise you what is presented in front of you and, and how to look at the numbers and how to analyze. You can spend a lot of time looking back, and it will still not help you to assess the needs in the future. And that's what the budget presents. It will help, you, it will help presents. you address uh, how, to, how to reduce the budget. It absolutely will. So history won't help you because you need to re redefine your need if you want to reduce the number. The, the fact that in 2016 there may be one or two or maybe zero SROs will not change the fact that right now we have three. And the question is, how many SROs do you want to have in fiscal 24? Again, exactly. I don't think it's your, don't so think it's your it's job it's to be arguing this. But Ms. Mr. Mr. Chairman, point, you know, point, point of order. First of all, I, 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 don't think, <clears throat> I don't think any of us need to be uncivil to each other. So I, um, I, I, I think I want to hear Olga's perspective. Um, and I understand that she's, um, she, she provides that perspective and the town pays her to provide that perspective and that's <laughs> important to the Board of Finance. I think what Kim is asking is not unreasonable. I right. do, I, you know, Olga says what the, what the needs are. Well, needs is a, um, Subjective. That's a, it, it's subjective as to what the town's needs are, because part of needs is what can the town afford. Mm -hmm. So um, I I do think that growth in personnel is uh, an important thing to take a look at. Yes. Um, but I I don't want our board to. I, I'm I'm not happy with the way things are going right now with. Um, the people feeling as if 
um, they have to argue about everything. I just feel like, Kim, if you want things, ask for them. Mm -hmm. Listen to other people's opinion. Um, if Kim asks for something as a member of the Board of Finance, he's entitled to get it yeah. unless it takes <clears throat> an excessive amount of administrative time that Olga and her department can't afford right now because they have to create numbers that don't exist. Um, so, I mean, can we just make a pact that we're going to try and do just a little bit better? Um, I, I don't mean to sound like a Mother Hubbard here, but uh, I don't, uh, I'm not comfortable with the way this is going. Part of, what, part of what's going on, clearly, is that in the past, we have members who have asked for things that they never got. They were told, oh sure, we'll get that, and they never received it. And that's just not acceptable. Right, I, I, I agree with that, um, mm -hmm. but I, I also don't think that you just start out by assuming that um, what you ask for you're not going to get. So, yeah. I what think it's fine if we if if Kim Kim as a board of finance regular member or as a board of finance alternate or any one on the board of finance that was elected, he should have the information that he needs and that he needs to share with us. I agree with you, Cheryl. Everything has to be done in a professional manner. I totally agree. Everybody's entitled to the floor. But it's very important to me as a Board of Finance member that we continue to get and should get everything that we need. And that's part of the issue. Within reason. Like Cheryl said, you know, that information is going to take somebody hours to put together. And is it relevant? You know, the needs of the town in 2013 are very different 10 years later. So exactly what are you comparing? I can tell you off the top of my head, the head count is lower. So I'm not sure, I, I really, I, all of that detailed information is not really going to tell you anything. But well, if we have the time and the ability to do it, we will do it to the best of our ability. Thank you. Okay, so Kim, you've got it in writing. You can send it sure, to all of us. It also includes Suzanne. Yep, here. Go ahead and uh, distribute. And I think if you if you can't, then if you could just shoot us a short email to everybody or to Wes, and you'll get it out to all of us. This is what we can't. Uh, you know, and here's why. Or and maybe we can get most of it. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's and not. Why I mean, would we compare 2013 dollars to 2023 dollars? I, I don't. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think it's the role of the selectmen to question why the board of finance members want information either. What? <laughs> no, I mean, I really don't. I think that that's a matter of respect between the boards, um, and so I I, th I I agree with. Uh, um, Thor and Dave here that there has been information that we've asked for that we've had to ask over and over and over to get so things that have seemed pretty simple. Um, this is not one of those things that is pretty simple and I think we're perfectly perfectly capable if Kim comes back and says here's some comparison of saying to him well we don't think 2013 counts for anything because times were different then. I think we're perfectly capable of seeing that. That's a decision for us to make. Let's all try and stay in our lanes, please. Um, but Cheryl, we have a limited amount of staff in our finance department. So I ask that you make thoughtful requests mm -hmm. and not frivolous requests that's, that's because of the amount of time that it takes us to put it together. I mean, there's a lot of stress on the that's finance right. department at the moment. That's my point of view. Okay. Interesting to see how that headcount has grown for that department. I think, I mean, I know that um, budgets it? are, I mean, I think we have 10 years of budgets on the new Fairfield uh, home website right now. Uh, okay, something might not be perfect, but I think that seeing trends like that, seeing a graph like that, seeing all that information is very valuable, particularly if you're a new board member, particularly. Or a new town member for that. Or a new town member, I mean, a new taxpayer. The, the, the authority here. 
I, I think it's wor very worthwhile. It might not be perfect, but I'm sure that since we already have a lot of the data, it can be culled, I would say, without a huge, huge, huge amount of effort. I also urge you to um, take a closer look at the binder. There's a lot of historical mm -hmm. information as well. Even if you right now go to the section of public safety, there's already a historical trend. Um, there's a graph that goes actually all the way back to 2013, and you have those graphs for each section. So mm -hmm. we separate our expenditure budgets um, on the type of function. Um, so we have public safety, um, health, uh, public works, and culture and recreation. <coughs> And these are the sections that are um, included in the binder, and the expenditures are broken down between those sections. So if you navigate to the beginning of each of that section, you will see a historical trend for that group of departments that go into it. So that bada boom, it, bada bing, there it that is. That should make it even yeah. easier than for, <laughs> for you to provide answers. I appreciate that. That should make it easier for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does it show the, the overtime budget in there per department? Uh, we include graphs and historical um, data going that far back for those categories, but then each individual budget um, request is included uh, in the binder, and that has um, 2020 actual. So for each department, you will see 20 fiscal year 20 actual numbers, fiscal year 21 actual numbers, fiscal year 22 actual numbers, uh, fiscal year 23 adopted, and fiscal year 24. Uh, department Project. request and board of selectment request. Mm -hmm. So for each department, there is a page with that data in the binder already. Okay. So, so that graph wouldn't indicate how many positions were in the department in a particular year, how much the, that particular position was being paid, or uh, any of that type of thing. Just it would also probably include materials. It would be the total cost for that department. That's what that graph would be. Yes, you will see the each line item in the department. You will not see a, a headcount for that mm -hmm. department. That inform you will see the total of payroll costs for the department, but not the number of headcount. Uh, there is a separate page um, that shows the list of town positions, um, but that only compares um, current fiscal year and 24 Past west. Year. So that's where you will see um, an right. actual list of the positions. Right, so the but information no I'm asking for is, is not... Yes, that will be in addition the to, yes. The information I'm asking for is not really... Yeah, know, the number of headcount, no. You will not find that. You will see the historical cost yep. per department in the binder already, but the number of headcount, um, no, that will not be in the binder as of now. Okay. And, and does the payroll on that graph, does that include uh, benefits or is that simply payroll? Uh, simply payroll, uh, you know, for medical... That type of benefit, we have a separate fund for that. And uh, employer taxes, um, we budget for it separately in a different category. What do we generally figure as a percentage for, for lumping in the benefits, the employee taxes? Is it another 25% roughly? <coughs> well, we don't really, we can't really budget like that because for our, uh, we only budget um, employee taxes, which is a flat percent, 7.65. All our other benefits, um, it's more like, you know, comprehensive package because for medical we're self-insured. We, you know, we're not premium based basically, so there is no one for one type say. So that's why it's a separate fund and we get our estimates of the claims uh, from our professional and then we have to budget for the total contribution. So it's not something we can allocate, I guess, per employee. So and other insurance like workers' comp, we get a pool because of overall numbers and overall payroll. We get that from PERMA. <laughs> So we don't really, I mean, we can estimate for a certain budget perspective if, if a certain position is considered to be added to the payroll, uh, then depending on that type of position, you know, we, we can provide an estimate because there's no one for one. Um, some positions like Teamsters or Public Works, they have um, their own medical insurance. So we have, you know, we pay employee taxes. If it's a police officer, they participate in MERS. So it really varies. So it, it really, if there is an interest to add a position, we would provide an estimate just for that position because there are other vari uh, variables that go into that calculation. Right, some of this would be estimate. I mean, some of it well, that, that Kim is asking for, all right, say no. if you go back 10 years, that would be fine, an estimate. Well, I, uh, yes, I mean, I have to look at the actual request. Right. So, uh, but I know, I mean, headcount is headcount, right. but the cost, it just depends what in the request. Right, thank you. So when you do a new employee, you come up with a number mm -hmm. that you estimate including benefits. So 
It's not clear to me why you couldn't do that for an existing employee. Mm -hmm. I have to look at the request. I'm not sure exactly, you know, all numbers are in the budget. They just that you may come from different direct, you know, different professionals, different directions, um, because some numbers we look at as a pool. So I'll have more when I actually look at the request. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions in any other category? Mm -hmm. I have a, yeah. oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Claudia. Oh, sorry. It's not necessarily about this, but I was wondering if you have received the audit yet, like what the status of that is. Um, yes, the audit has been complete. Um, okay. It has been, you know, filed um, on time. Um, I believe I discussed with the chairman the process is that there will be meetings set up with the audit subcommittee. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. once uh, the audit is accepted, then it will be distributed okay. to the members. Yep. All right. Thanks. Mark? Yeah, there was a discussion in the paper about the SROs on, in the summer doing oh, yeah. Marine Patrol. Mark, the only point is that the SROs in the uh, outside of the school year come back into the patrol schedule. Mm -hmm. That's that's no, they no, work. They work. Yes. yes. So my question is, at present, we're going to be adding positions on a normal schedule. No. 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 So instead of being on patrol in this town. And covering those patrol, we would be covering a marine patrol, which is environmental's so, job. No, no, no. So we have, um, I, this has been analyzed by um, Sergeant Arachi. Mm -hmm. We can absorb, if, if those, if those, if we get to the point where we even have those patrols, mm -hmm. we're talking about maybe three days a week it, those patrols will be absorbed into our current budget. And if, if, if that is his judgment, that we will be able to do that. Um, and I trust his judgment. I know, I, 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 I trust the, the sergeant's judgment, but if we're pulling offices for Marine Patrol, which is supposed to be done by Candlewood Lake Authority. No, 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 no okay. two different things. The Marine Patrol is limited to boating law. Okay, we have issues outside of voting law that we feel um, need to be addressed by law enforcement. Okay. That, if you're looking to a state agency, would be DEEP and NCON mm -hmm. police. Mm -hmm. Their staffing has dropped dramatically. So for the entire western part of Connecticut, there is a very small pool of officers. We are very lucky if we get one boat on Candlewood Lake on the weekends. We, we feel that we need to have a law enforcement presence at certain points. We also know that now we are responsible for investigations of accidents that are within our borders. So there are a lot of things that brought us to consider a marine element of our police department. It is not unusual. Um, and, you know, I, I, this was not something I did on my own. This is something that I, um, uh, we have been working towards for a number of years. Um, and this is what we think we need to do for public safety in the town of New Fairfield. There is no boat in the budget. Um, this is something that we're looking for state funding for. So, you know, please don't, we're not adding any cost to, we haven't added any cost for personnel for this to our budget. Mm -hmm. so, so if, if the Marine Patrol didn't happen, how much would that reduce overtime then if those officers were used in other ways other than a Marine Patrol? It, it won't. We will absorb the current staff into that patrol. And, not, not and the sergeant feels that he has room to do that. But, but if the Marine Patrol didn't happen, then that staff would be used, I would assume, to reduce some overtime, unless they got laid off. I, I would, I, Kim, I, no. 
I, I mean, that, that we don't even know that we're going to have a marine patrol yet. Um, no, it isn't used. And normally, we add additional staff to patrol. So whether it's a patrol on the road or a patrol on the water, um, and how many patrols that that, you know, when we get a final schedule, then we would be able to calculate that. But we're, so we're nowhere near there yet. So is, is, is the current proposed budget based on having the Marine Patrol or not having the Marine Patrol? The current budget is based on not having a Marine Patrol, but okay. the sergeant has also analyzed that schedule and determined that we could absorb the Marine Patrol without exceeding our budget. Hmm. That doesn't seem possible. If, okay. you add, if you add hours, how can that not increase the budget? We, we aren't there yet. We don't have a boat. We, don't, we, we, ha we are not there yet. So this is really putting the cart before the horse. Especially for this year, because whether we could even get a boat for this year is, is questionable. So it, 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 there's a lot of it. I mean, I don't think you need to worry about the boat because I think the fire department has a boat that's available for all the squads. Um, it, it, and I think, stop, I think it, please. You know, I'd like to finish. And I think, I think in Danbury, you'll find that the police, if they need to go out on the water, call the fire department and they, take, they go with the fire department out on the water. Okay. We've We have already had those discussions. The police boat would, or the fire boat would not be available full time to our police. So it, it, that's a non starter. Why, why would that not be available? Because it, that's not its designated use. And, and that was a discussion with the fire department. So I, I don't see why this is part of this year's budget discussion since we don't have a boat. We don't, we aren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Um, going forward, if, if you do have questions after you go through the binder mm -hmm. at home, um, like we did in, in previous years, if you have questions, send them to me so that then I could consolidate them and push them on to the finance director and, and the selectmen. Uh, that sort of avoids, hopefully, duplicate asks for the same question. But uh, I mean, the budget is over 200 pages. I'm sure once we have more time, and also we got a Wednesday meeting coming up. Um, if you have needs for other, uh, more information, just uh, uh -huh. you know, just send it to me. As in the past, we've forwarded, and I think in the past, we've got most of the questions answered. Same with the board of health? Same, same with, with the board, the board of health, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, anything else? Any other questions? Because if we're done with questions, then we'll just go into recess. Because we've got uh, 1045 for the Board of Ed. I, I have just one question sure. for um, the Board of Selectmen. Um, Pat, this is just an opinion question. What was the hardest part for you on your Board of Selectmen budget this year? I'm just. I don't know if one part is harder oh, than okay. the other. <laughs> it might all be the same. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, we, we removed a lot of um, capital requests, and and that is going to catch up with us. Yeah. So. Um, I agree with that. You know that that is going to be hardest going forward. Uh -huh. I, I I think when we cut those things out, you have to realize they aren't going away. They come back. So. Uh -huh. that I want to make, uh, and it's not so much on the Board of Selectmen budget, but it's to the public um, from last um, Monday's meeting. I've gone back and listened and reviewed and stuff, and I just want to apologize, I think, to Tim Blair and maybe Tom Vitale. Um, we, uh, we should have had the marked up version of the... <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how that happened. We don't usually do that, but it, it just was an error on our part, and uh, I apologize for that. 
and also the um, um, it's important to me to be accurate and I do want to apologize for saying that the change did nothing about the limit on the debt service because um, clearly that was changed. It was not something that our board talked about. It was not something we knew was right. going to happen. Right. I should have noticed it when I read it uh, prior to the meeting, mm -hmm. but um, it was it was not what we intended to do. And um, and when Olga and Terry worked on it, they haven't been here long enough to realize that we purposely set the Board of Finance at the time purposely set that debt limit where we did prior to the vote on the new school. We set it lower than state statute. They were trying to make us consistent with state statute, so I understand how all of this happened. I just didn't recognize it in time, and I, um, and I, and I think it's important to own up to mistakes that we make, and I want to own up to that one, um, and I'll try and do a better job. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, that's behind us now because we're not going to reconsider our debt policy for the time being. But um, as we start down this budget process, I think it's really important that the public have as much trust in us as they can, and that's based on accurate information. And I gave out some Thank inaccurate you, information. Thank you, Cheryl, because that was that really was um, very convoluted. It, uh, it, it really, thank you, yeah, it was. I just didn't realize it, it I, I kind of looked at the red line when I got it and thought, well, this is all part of what we talked about. I focused on the section that, um, that, that we meant to change. I didn't focus on the above one. Uh, then I made the comment, then Kim pointed out that, mm -hmm. oh no, we are trying to raise our own debt ceiling. Debt I went back and I looked at it and I said, oh, geez, he's right. And, uh, yeah. and, sure, how, and, how, and how frustrating is that when Kim is right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, That's yeah. a terrible thing. Exactly. <laughs> and Cheryl, exactly. in your defense, I mean, I think had we been looking at the red line during that meeting, you would not have been confused by that. You know, we looked at the red line a week or so before, and then at the meeting we were looking at a non-red line, and it's right. much less obvious in the non-red line. So lines. at any rate. I just put that out there, not on the rest of the board, just for me. Uh, I just want to start this process as clean as possible with all of our members, all of us trying to be as, um, what's the word, transparent mm -hmm. and professional, and professional as possible mm -hmm. and have that same relationship with the public. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and no, I don't want to go through what we went through last year. Um, I don't think. Why that not? I, well, I don't think. I don't think that we will because, first of all, this would be the second year that you guys have gone through this. Last year was your first, and um, and now, I mean, let's be honest. There are four votes here, so at some point, you guys will decide what you're going to do, and you'll do it, and um, and that's the way it goes. So. Um, I think that, you know, as long as we can talk about things until we get up to mm -hmm. that point, mm -hmm. all of us will be heard, all of us will be, our views will be taken into account, and then as Don Kellogg said, it'll be up to the public to decide. And, uh, and we certainly want Olga's point of view, because we paid her a lot of money not to listen to her. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I think it's, I, I really am very glad that you brought up earlier today that I'm just hoping that all of us can uh, remember that we're all here to benefit the town and we all really need to adopt a very professional uh, manner and hear other people's opinions. It's very important. I'm glad you brought that up early today. So that would be helpful. Thank you. So That's it for me. Anything else? Anything else? Mm -hmm. All right, we're in uh, recess. 1024. One recess until 1045. Okay. Quentin, you can stop the tape.
this morning and now we are going to hear the education budget and presenting this morning we have two people the chairman of the board of ed Don Cepalone and our superintendent Dr. Ken Craw so again it's going to be three different areas the presentations will go first we'll stop and then we'll have time for public comment which is your opportunity as a taxpayer to make comments on the education budget and then when that is over with, it'll we'll end the meeting with uh, questions from the uh, Board of Finance members. And again, to remind everybody, the Board of Finance will be meeting every Wednesday in the month of March. So if you have uh, via Zoom for the most, I think for the first two meetings. Uh, so if you have other questions you can attend or comments, you can attend those meetings. So with that, uh, Dom, I think you're kicking it off. Yeah. The floor is yours. Thanks, Russ. Um, appreciate that. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with everyone, and you know, we really um, want to present something to you that we believe makes a lot of sense. You know, the, the New Fairfield School District has faced its fair share of challenges during the pandemic, and um, significant adjustments have been made to meet these challenges and simultaneously meet the needs of all of our students. Things are different post-pandemic, and this is evident in many ways, which I won't get into here. What I can say with certainty is that the learning and social-emotional needs of our students have changed dramatically. Working on this year's school budget took all of this into consideration, as everyone here today will see in today's presentation. It offers a plan that will continue to support the work taking place in our K-12 program. Um, our district has a significant workload of, ahead, but it is clear, or pardon me, but there is clear and compelling evidence that dollars have been spent effectively and purposefully and not wastefully. The superintendent and I will present a budget that provides continuity to our students and staff at a time when they need it the most. This is a carefully crafted budget that focuses on continuing to address the learning loss created by the pandemic while offering a roadmap to full academic recovery. This is done by providing a rigorous academic program, remedial support, social and emotional support, and sports and extracurricular clubs and activities that prepare our students for success in college, a trade school, the military, and ultimately a life as a citizen who is making positive contributions to our society. Um, I respect the Board of Finance and your responsibility to manage this, the town's finances in a thoughtful and fiscally conservative manner. And I understand that competing forces are there that you have to contend with. I only ask that you keep an open mind and after we are done today, please take the necessary time to consider what we are proposing here with a lens that puts our students first. Thank you. So the agenda is as such, we'll look at priorities, we'll look at our accomplishments, assumptions, enrollment, class sizes, efficiencies, and our operating capital budget in the process. So the priorities, and it, 
it will always be the priority is continued academic growth. We're all here to serve the young people in this community, and, and we believe that the work that's taking place will continue to, to provide academic growth for our kids. And that happens when instruction is solid and curriculum is meaningful. There's no way you get to that top of that pyramid without the support from high quality instruction and curriculum being provided through the work of the administrative team and the teacher leaders and our coaches and support staff who really make every effort to make sure um, the three-legged stool is there. That's curriculum, that's effective teaching, and that's student readiness. Those three parts have to come together um, in order to achieve um, success for kids. And the base of this is a healthy learning environment. The pandemic has changed a lot of things. We're seeing a lot of uh, challenges with young people, and this is not only in our um, town, this is across the country. Kids have come back with significant um, social emotional challenges on top of their academic challenges. And this district, under the leadership of our superintendent and his team, has worked very diligently to address those needs uh, in the best way possible. So some accomplishments that are important, and we talk about um, you know, return on investment, and, and what's happening, how's this money being spent, and how is it you know, showing up, and how is it tangible for, for the taxpayer and for the community. Meeting House was named the School of Distinction for ELA growth for all students and ELA growth for high need students. You know, we, we, it's one thing to look at growth for all students, but when you also have attached to that growth for kids who have additional challenges, that's significant. That's, that's an important accomplishment, and, and we need to really uh, give kudos to the team at Meeting House for, for this kind of success. More accomplishments, and you know, these are things that don't just happen, right? These, these are things that take a lot of um, effort. So the integration of Meeting House and Consolidated has been um, a success, and it's an ongoing process. There's a, a Bridges math program in K-5 to that by all accounts is getting rave reviews by you know, the people on the front line, our practitioners, our teachers. The students are accepting that. Algebra one in seventh grade <clears throat> has been successful. <clears throat> Pardon me. Implementation of phonemic awareness routines in K-1. You know, the K-2 to two is where kids learn how to read. And, you know, phonemic awareness was there, then it went away, and it's really, you know, the way kids learn how to read. And it's <clears throat> really good to see that it's where it's supposed to be. You know, the growth we'll show through the, in the presentation is also because of a consistent K-8 intervention model where students' needs are addressed and met. Um, and there's evidence of success. You know, addressing social, emotional, and acceptance is you know what implementation of no place for hate at, at the high school is you know kids have to kids live in a world that's very diverse um, may not look exactly the way it does in New Fairfield and it's important for kids to respect and understand differences in others and our strides program which is really um, gives so much respect to some of our kids with additional needs and how we want to keep services in district to support young people as they transition into the workforce and you know that helps address some of the costs of, of our placement. Music and arts, we've done amazing things with our art program, as you can see by kids who are selected for the Western Regionals and you know awards for the play and, and our music tech classes at the high school, which is gives kids a career path. And you know who who can debate the success of our of our athletics program in our community and, and how we bring the championships home. Dr. Croy, you want to thank you up here? I've been in New Fairfield for seven months now, and I'm very pleased to be here and to present to you all uh, 
this morning. And uh, the future is bright for the students of New Fairfield. Uh, you know, the investments that have been made uh, in facilities and the educational programs. Uh, I'm sure a question that a Board of Finance will typically have is, well, what have we uh, received from this investment? And Dom has highlighted <coughs> some of the accolades. I'd like to talk about some of the results because, uh, you know, it's not the only thing that we look at, uh, you know, and I'll show you some, some other examples of the kinds of things that measure uh, the kind of uh, programs and services that, that we're providing here. But when we look at uh, standardized testing data from last spring and we compare it to where we were pre-pandemic, our students through the, the coaching uh, in the intervention work that we've provided in the professional development, we've seen the recovery from the pandemic. Scores uh, in ELA and math for both all students and high needs students have just about come back to those levels. Now, we want to go further than that, of course, but that is a good sign based on the investments that were made last year. Uh, and additionally, Let's talk about growth. The percentage of growth that New Fairfield has been making in ELA and math, and this slide highlights ELA first. So since 2018-19, uh, we have seen in this most current year that our students are making substantially more growth than other districts. Our colleagues at the state level have said, well, what, are you, what are you doing in New Fairfield? Because you have outperformed, in terms of growth, the, uh, the Connecticut, all students, other so neighboring districts that we have here as well. And so we're poised to continue this trend with continued emphasis on the coaching of teachers, professional development, and supporting students with learning recovery with appropriate interventions. Uh, so if you, if you see, um, you know, in ELA, all students, that red band, significantly higher than the blue band, but I think everyone will be really pleased to see. Look at, look at the difference between 2018-19 for math and 21-22. Uh, what, 62-63% in 2018-19, uh, the, the growth rate in almost 80% last year. Uh, same thing for, uh, for high needs, significant growth. So we want to continue that. Now, I don't just look at metrics in ELA and math when we, when we talk about uh, you know, uh, you know, results. We also want to look at the classes that come through here. We've spent, uh, you know, some of our students since pre-K have been through our programs. And so right now, uh, you know, class of 22, we saw 87% going to four-year colleges. Other pathways for students and their interests uh, include two-year colleges, trade school, and other students have gone off to the military or a gap year or right, right to work. So there is a presentation embedded in this slide that you can go to to see a uh, presentation from November on all the, the different um, uh, data that we have related to the class of 2022. But when people are shopping what town they want to come to and, and buy in, they'll look at their high school as the flagship and what does it have to offer? Honors courses. Uh, we have pre-college classes, 25 uh, potential offerings for AP courses, early college experience courses from UConn, which students, if they achieve at certain levels, can get college credit for. And in addition to that, in recent years, have added ways that students can position themselves for college by taking clusters of courses that we've laid out. And for example, we have an allied health pathway where a student who's interested in pre-med or, or other health careers can take and get certifications, whether it's EMT or, or um, uh, CPR or other things that can lead to uh, an area of interest in position which is soon themselves. <clears throat> Another way you know, to look at the investment uh, K-12, pre-K-12, what other things do we, do we offer? When people look uh, to come to a community, they look at class size and they look at it very closely. 
will my student get that personalized experience? And in New Fairfield, you've, you've supported a highly personalized learning environment that's also large enough and comprehensive enough to meet the diverse needs of students. And we have those necessary counseling support services. Uh, the fact that the investment has been there in the new facility is amazing. That's a generational change that the community has supported. <clears throat> and we're all very excited to see the new high school open on time in the fall uh, and under budget. And so um, it, the, for a student, it, it goes beyond ELA in math. Their interests may or may not lie in those areas um, or in their needs as well. So um, we, we certainly respond to the mandates in special education. We have a talented and gifted program now that goes from grades three through eight. And so we added the grades six through eight this past year, which is fantastic. And um, we know that those students have unique learning needs. STEAM is an emphasis throughout the district. Art and music, we know how critical the arts are. We've, uh, we've also expanded our music program to, in this budget, we move from grades um, for orchestra four to six to now add grade seven in the future years, looking to have those cohorts move into the high school. So that is critical. Um, a comprehensive program includes an orchestra program through graduation. Five world languages at the high school as well. And then, uh, obviously, students beyond the school day have interests in other things, athletics, theater, clubs, and there's a uh, full complement of those. So now transitioning to the budget, and, I, and on behalf of uh, the Board of Education, many of whom are seated behind me, I'm, I'm pleased to just uh, you know, share some of the assumptions that the board adopted as they went into this process. Certainly, those <coughs> class size goals are prominent as they are each year. We have the contractual increase in bargaining units. Dom talked a great deal about the learning recovery that needs to take place. Um, and we understand that uh, the federal funding is, uh, is, is almost gone. Uh, there's uh, only a very modest level of federal funding that we have available to put towards our non-payroll accounts. Um, but our staffing plan's no longer funded uh, with the same level as it was last year. Increased costs to goods and services we've all experienced, and of course, we have our mandates in special education. I'm pleased to report to you that enrollment is stable, and it's uh, looking at just a slight uptick over the next uh, five years. In next year, we have an increase of 27 students primarily at the middle school. Um, the lower and, and, and upper school are essentially the same enrollment. But I want to draw your attention to K-12 special education. And we have seen a change uh, in recent years, and this year is no different. An increase in the number of students identified in grades K through 12. Uh, when this uh, presentation was, was made in January, 22 additional students since the start of the year have been identified and uh, our identification rate uh, has increased by 1% since last year and that's, that's due to the, the many challenges and needs um, that, that students uh, have faced. So one uh, real good piece of news here, uh, the district through several programs that we have in-house has been able to maintain outplacements at a consistent level. Um, obviously, we'd like for all students to be able to remain in the district, but that's not always the case. you are not always able to do that. Those, those numbers in comparison uh, to some other districts are, um, are, are more modest. So that's the enrollment story, very good, stable. Class size projection, the bottom right, you can see our class size goals. Uh, that the, the board has targeted and the number of sections and projected enrollment from NESDAC. Uh, uh, we, we get our enrollment projections every October and <clears throat> this is where we're positioning. So we are projecting 42 uh, classrooms in grades K 
K through eight this year. That is the same number of classrooms last year, with the change being in uh, grade four. Uh, more students there, so we've increased the section. In grade five, reduced the section. So these numbers are driven by enrollment in those class size guidelines. So then the staffing plan. So when we take into account enrollment, take into account the class size guidelines, the need for continued growth, need for continued recovery in the pandemic, the, uh, the plan that you have um, before you from the board is uh, virtually the same staffing plan as last year, virtually the same. So when we look at, um, there are obviously some, some minor adjustments within that plan, but certified staffing is flat. Now, we, we have seen an increase, uh, which is reflected in the payroll, uh, in approximately $160,000, is uh, the addition of 6.4 FTE for paraprofessionals, that's budget to budget. So, uh, 6.4 paraprofessionals, because we've had some students move into the system, with existing IEPs, with, the, with needs for one-on-ones, uh, other emerging needs throughout the district. We are trying to manage this as best we can with, within uh, the FY23 budget, um, but these were unanticipated uh, needs since last year. But I do want to I, I share uh, several things in the next two slides that the board is proud of, and those are the efficiencies. Uh, you know, over the past five years, we've reduced the number of administrators from 20 to 18. Uh, and did a little bit of restructuring as well this past year by, uh, you know, we have uh, Paul Gouveia as our new director of technology by moving from a certified educator to a non-certified position. Mm -hmm. We did uh, have some, some savings as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> we are looking to seek uh, through a competitive grant uh, additional school psychologists, given the, the number of evaluations uh, and the increased number of IEPs we're, we're seeing. So, so that has been uh, something we're looking at to just kind of keep, uh, keep the increase uh, down. Uh, I mentioned the in-house program, Strides, ILS, BEST. Um, it, you know, we could talk more about those, but they, they are critical programs to um, uh, ensuring that students have appropriate opportunities here within the system. Uh, and insourcing is critical, meaning uh, rather than contracting services outside the district, which we have to do to some extent, the, where we can see savings by having staff in-house, we do that, uh, whether it's OT, BT, uh, or BCBAs. Uh, we were able, during this budget, you know, Carrie, Julie, myself have really looked at the FY23 budget. Are there ways that we could reduce, defray, uh, remove some of the planned expenses for this year, knowing that this year is a challenging year to, um, to mitigate the increase. So we have 390,000 emergency relief funds towards non-payroll items that would not be, they would be non-recurring items in this, uh, in, in this budget so that they would not come back uh, next year. Uh, facilities, you could, uh, I won't read everything here, but uh, facilities, projects, the shared services with the town. Many towns talk about shared services. New Fairfield, in, in you know, my career, this is the first town I've seen it done very well and to this level. So, um, you know, everyone should, uh, you know, the town and education side, feel proud of that. Um, and, and certainly the consolidated meeting House Hill campus gives uh, give us some uh, efficiencies where you know we have one library media specialist uh, instead of two we have uh, the ability of people not moving between buildings for services um, you know that that's a better use of staff so that's helpful as well now you're aware the operating budget is a 2.5 uh, million dollar increase equating to 5.99 percent. Uh, when you look at last year's budget and you incorporate the, um, there, there were federal funds that were used to reduce it and appropriately so. Here, this is a comparable budget to last year. When you look at um, the fact that 
we just don't no longer have those federal funds available to apply to the salary accounts. In fact, I'd say this budget in some ways is lower because if you take into account inflation, um, and we've really scrubbed our non-salary accounts, um, and uh, here with the budget drivers, uh, you know, I'll go through those, but, but a real good example of the fact that we've really gone through our, our non-payroll accounts, facilities, uh, you know, repairs and maintenance uh, is down slightly, or just about flat. Uh, so, so we are going to take care of our facilities, but we're doing it at, at a minimal uh, change to, to uh, the current plan. But anyway, going back to the top here, salaries and benefits of the 5.99%, just over 5% of it is in salaries and benefits. And then when you take into account transportation and utilities, transportation, we're in year four of a five-year contract with for student that's baked into the budget we have no flexibility with that and then utilities and um, fuel oil and so forth um, you know we, we certainly monitor and look for the best prices there along with uh, the, the partners in the town side so um, you know when you get to uh, the um, the non-payroll accounts uh, <coughs> special ed curriculum technology we have some uh, some increases there in special education due to transportation, uh, outplaced students, providing them with, with, with transportation, but also specialized evaluations. We've seen a need, a greater need for those, and that accounts for that, uh, that increase. Uh, curriculum, professional development, structural supplies, so that is due to the fact that we, we don't have um, as much of the ESSER funds being applied there. And then um, you can see the rest there. But most of this is is uh, is due to mostly increased due to salary benefits. <laughs> and then uh, lastly, and I'll hand it back to, to Dom. The capital improvement budget, which we have had a couple of conversations with the board of finance related to capital, we have just over a half million dollars in requests that we've been able to. Um, mitigate somewhat and we really appreciate the $95,000 towards items number two and five that the Board of Finance approved from uh, the Board of Ex Expenditure Surplus Funds. Uh, we are also looking to apply $200,000 in cap and non funds that exist in the account to reduce this request and, and we're certainly available to discuss this. Phil is not here today but in future meetings have him also if you have specific questions for Phil. Yeah, so if you look at budgets in our neighboring towns, um, we're not an outlier. We're, we're right there where other towns are. And so this isn't, well, you Fairfield's overspending here. No, we're in line with our neighboring communities. And this is the challenge that, you know, all our communities are facing. As we, you know, want to navigate post ESSER funding and making sure that you know we still provide the services necessary to, to continue this trajectory of our students um, overcoming learning loss and excel. So this has been the process. And it's been taken very seriously by everyone here, and we just. <coughs> want everyone to understand that this has been a thoughtful, you know, open discussion between the administrators, the teachers, the staff, and the Board of Education to really come to this place, and, and we really hope you, you take a good, careful look at what we've presented and um, understand what, what we're facing as a school district. And, Uh, just a little housekeeping, and uh, if Quentin, you can pull up our website. Okay, in the top left-hand corner, all of the information regarding the 23-24 budget is located. You can find uh, the Board of Ed Adopted Budget uh, presentations. I'll include this presentation uh, you know, on, on, on this site as well. Notice at the bottom, we had a list of FY23-24 Board of Ed budget questions and answers. You um, have
have questions, uh, submit them to, to Wes, who will, who will provide them to my office, and we'll work on them, you know, given when the meetings are occurring and the, uh, the depth of the request, you know, we'll, we'll have to just, you know, because I guess our next meeting is Wednesday, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have to uh, try to get back to you on those. Our team is here to, to answer those questions. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Don? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um, right. So you're 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 done. We're done. We're <laughs> done. For now. For now. <laughs> All right. Next uh, part of our agenda is uh, public comment, and then after public comment, there'll be questions from the board of finance members. So, anybody from the public who wishes to, let's see, Quinn, where's the microphone? Who has the microphone? Is it in? Is that in front of you? <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> this is from the public. This is your opportunity to comment on the education budget. Um, this is our first really face-to-face -face meeting to do this. Um, next, the next two Wednesdays, the Board of Finance will have a meeting solely on the education budget, and it'll be a Zoom meeting. Uh, but this is face-to-face. -face. So if you want to see all of our faces so we can see your face, please go to the podium, state your name, and let us have your comment. Hi, I'm Emily Savino. Can to speak and uh, Is it turned on? I'm Emily. It doesn't amplify in this room because it'll echo up your mics. So just try to be as loud as you can. I'm Emily Savino, and I recently wrote a petition. <laughs> Gotta shout a little bit. I know. She doesn't do blues. Okay. That's okay. Working on it. I'm Emily Savino, and I recently wrote a petition to keep strings in school. And I know there was a a proposed budget to keep it for seventh grade, but I know many of the strings players want to keep it going for eighth grade and high school. And it's just that a lot of kids they don't want to do chorus, they don't want to do drama or sports. And we spend a lot of time trying to learn how to play our instruments. And also, our family spent many hundreds of dollars on our violins, violas, cellos. And that all, all that money goes to waste if we just stop playing it. And the petition got 82 signatures, which is way more kids that are the that are in strings, and which shows that th there are a lot of people who want strings in school, even if they don't want to join it. And I know nobody in this room right now would cut band. And band has a lot more people, but strings is just as important to the strings players as band is to the band players. And we invested a lot of time and the concert, we all look forward to those and we want to do our best. And also if strings is cut, we'd be forced to either play another instrument or do general music. And if we already know how to learn, if we already know how to read the notes, it just is boring for everyone because we already know everything for general music, which is just learning how to read notes and maybe play a little bit like on their quarter, or I know that was what general music, but yeah, so. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I didn't totally hear, but that was suggesting that she'd like to see orchestra and strings instru instruction continued past seventh grade. Is that essentially what was said? Yes. Yeah. Thank you I very know, much. Thank you. Earlier in the year, there was some question of whether or not strings would be continued into seventh grade for the next school year, mm -hmm. which is what prompted the, um, my daughter actually took, was the one who suggested doing a petition to continue strings going. And I know that, uh, I don't know how the timing ended up working if the Board of Ed got the petition before they put together this budget proposal. But I know that my daughter, she, like she said, had gotten 82 signatures from her classmates, including many students who
had not uh, thought about doing strings previously. And we were very happy to see that the Board of Ed's budget does include strings for the fall. So we would be very happy if, if this budget gets approved and that continues and maybe in the future continues on beyond seventh grade. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Who's next for public comment? My name's Don Kellogg, uh, Rockbridge Court. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have two daughters in the school system. One's a freshman, one's in fifth grade. Um, my, my wife and I have been uh, attended many of the workshops, the Board of Ed workshops, uh, for the budget for this year. Um, and I just want to stand here and, and voice my support of the budget. I think the, the Board of Ed has done a great job in trying to manage the, the demands of our children, you know, the needs of our children with the restrictions that we're facing with, with uh, inflation and uh, other constraints that they're, they're dealing with. I think they've uh, put forth a, a responsible budget. Uh, clearly, it's in line with the schools that, account, that we consider our peers. And uh, you know, I urge you all to, to move forward with the budget as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Who's next for public comment on the school budget? Hello, my name is Diane Persis DeSanto and I live on Sunset Drive. I've been blessed to be a parent of two children. One's currently in our school system and the other will be in this fall. I firsthand witnessed our kids are struggling in various ways in all age groups, from aggression, both physical, verbal, lack of ability to speak or speak properly, falling behind in core skills such as math, reading, and writing, and that's just to name a few. How did all this happen? Their lives were canceled for two years. Critical rites of passage, like graduations, canceled. Club events, canceled. School dances, sports activities, birthday parties, family and social gatherings. They were all canceled. On top of this, many of us lost loved ones, some we could have been together with during that time but chose not to for fear of getting them sick and now they're gone. There's no do-over for these events. The time and the opportunity, they're gone. We all have our anecdotes of our own personal trauma and left with scars. I broke. The past few years broke me like it did a lot of parents. My kids saw my pain as much as I tried to shield them from it. I have no doubt they're carrying some of my pain now too, like other kids in our community are. Every generation has their character building worldly event. The pandemic was ours. We're now in the rebuilding phase. We're getting back to some semblance of normalcy, but the damage inflicted upon our kids is exposing its ugly self now. We need your support for our Board of Ed, who's working hard to turn this ship around. They can't turn back time, but we could pick up the pieces we can rebuild. To be a teacher in today's environment, one is expected to be a bodyguard from school shooters, therapist for behavioral issues, janitor now because classrooms need to be sterilized, protector from outside agendas, all while trying to teach the intended material which is supposed to be their core job. Teachers don't want apples anymore, they want sanitizing wipes. You know, that's a lot of pressure to impose on someone, an incredibly high ask. Our Board of Ed's budget needs to encompass all that and more. And for our seniors with fixed income, on one hand, yes, our town taxes are what they are. However, Connecticut is becoming a more retirement-friendly state. A bill was passed in recent years that will eventually eliminate Connecticut retirement income from pensions and annuities in 2025 and thereafter. Taxpayers can qualify if their federal AGI is below 75 for single folks and 100K for married. Additionally, another phase out includes tax on taxpayers' distributions from IRAs. Starting in 2026, Connecticut will no longer tax Social Security, pension, and annuity retirement income, nor most IRA distributions. For 2023, retirement income will be exempt from taxation by 70%. That's increasing total savings by another 14 plus 25% of your eligible IRA income. 
Additionally, the Social Security Administration had announced there will be an 8.7 COLA adjustment for 2023. That's real money lining their pockets from our state. Your total benefit will far surpass the effects of inflation we're feeling now. And our Board of Ed and folks like myself cannot say they're receiving the same benefit like this now. Our finances continue to erode. Considering all this, I'm respectfully asking our Board of Finance and our community to honor our Board of Ed's well-thought, fiscally responsible budget to support what our community needs. Our children are our future. The opportunity is now. We all may not agree on the exact plan on how we get there, but they're trying. They showed up. They showed me they care. Amid all these external forces at play, they're still trying. We are fortunate to have folks so dedicated to the cause of our town. Our children and their teachers need our collective show of support now. Please give them this gift and put an end to canceling our children's lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Who's next for public comment? Last opportunity to talk face to face here. <laughs> All right, Joshua Beckett Flores, Arrow Meadow Road. Um, I just want to take a second and commend uh, Dr. Craw and the Board of Education for highlighting amongst the unexpected costs and overlays that have been built into this budget a lot of the one-on-one -on -one instruction that has been given to kids. Um, it's my daughter. She's seven. Uh, she experienced the lockdown going into ELC at a moment when reading, math, and basic skills were critical. And those skills got moved to an online format, uh, first in Google Classroom and then through Zoom and very other formats. Uh, and it was hard. It was a challenge because trying to explain to a six-year-old why she needs to sit in front of a computer for four hours versus being able to go and play with her classmates versus being able to do certain things, reading, math, etc., was a challenge. Like many parents, when she returned full classroom instruction, we saw that there were skills that had been below par, like many other kids, not just in our school system, but around the country. As many school systems did, they decided that the best approach to that was one-on-one, -on -one, in addition to normal classroom instruction. It's time consuming, it can be expensive, but it works. It gets kids back up on par. And my daughter's reading is on par with other second graders, and I have every confidence in our school system that as she grows through it, she will be an excellent student. So my ask for the board is in this conversation when it comes to the education budget, dollars and cents are important, taxes are important. Everyone in this room is a taxpayer, minus kids. Um, look past the dollars and cents and look at the impacts. Because some of these impacts are short term. Not every kid is going to need one-on-one -on -one instruction forever. We're in a challenging time. But for us to get to the place we want to be in terms of our school system, it's going to be challenging conversations and choices. So I would just urge careful, thoughtful, and deliberative discussion on this budget process moving forward. And thank you all for your time and energy on this. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Anybody else? Public comment, education budget. Okay, going once, going twice. And again, after this meeting, the Board of Finance will have Zoom meetings every Wednesday in March where public comment will be at the beginning of the meeting and at the end of the meeting. If after hearing this presentation, your uh, questions come up or comments come up, we'd love to hear them. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, last part of the agenda where Board of Finance members will take time to uh, ask the initial questions for the Board of Education budget. Who would like to go first? I would. Cheryl? I would, uh, I'll just, um, Dr. Craw, you were sitting here, Dom, you came in, so you know that uh, I'm probably going to ask you for um, the, um, uh, to review capital with us um, at some point during the month of March, whenever Wes sets up the, tells you that the, 
And, uh, and it would be great to have Phil here during that time and to review like the five-year plan and, uh, and think about our, the future things that need to be done and what need to be bonded and so forth. Even if we can't do it this, even if we're not gonna do it in the next fiscal year to at least allow us to plan future fiscal years. So I would ask that. Um, my other comment would be um, kudos. Uh, it, it's very reassuring to see our students making a comeback after COVID. Um, last year, um, the last year the information wasn't nearly so positive, and so it's great to see that um, what we've been doing is working. And I also really want to um, offer my appreciation for talking about return on investment. Um, for some of you who have been on the board for a long time, you know that that has been a, a big bugaboo of mine that, um, that we really need to look at, both for the town and for the school, our return on investment. And I, I love the fact that um, you've looked at uh, standardized test scores but also that you've looked at other things, that you have other measurements in there. They're all important, um, and I don't discount the standardized testing, but I also don't discount uh, what happens to our students once they leave the system and other ways of measuring that we're making a difference. I really appreciate that. I urge you to keep that up, um, and I, um, uh, I, I think it's really important for taxpayers, um, especially those without children in school, to be able to see uh, and hear what that return on investment is. Because lots of times parents with kids in school, as Josh talked about, they can see it in what happens with their children. But um, uh, you know, the story in New Fairfield for a long time has been that our math sucked and our, our, our math achievement had sucked. And uh, pardon my French, but, and um, it, it appears, I won't say that we're doing great, but it appears that we're doing much better than we were and that we may have a, a formula, time will tell, that will allow us to be even better. So um, I appreciate that, I'm encouraged by that and I would just urge um, Dr. Craw and the entire Board of Education to keep on that path of looking at that return on investment in all ways of measuring it um, because the breadth of education um, strings programs as well as every other kind of learning that there is is all important. So um, I, I appreciate that, thank you. Show. Who's next? Questions? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation today. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, appreciate the information um, showing uh, other districts in our region what they're doing. Um, quick, quick specific question. Last year uh, there was conversation about maybe an efficiency of eliminating an administrative position as a result of the combination of consolidated and meeting house. Um, into one campus. I was wondering if that reduction is reflected uh, in this year's budget. The, uh, the administrative staffing for the district is the same as we currently are staffed, including at Khan's Meeting House. And uh, given that, <clears throat> you know, that is our facility with the most students, we have uh, 960 students, if you want to take into account pre-K mm -hmm. in, in that building, uh, and with the increased behavioral needs, with the increased um, uh, IEPs, because administrators deliver IEPs, the supervision evaluation work, in order to uh, support all those needs, we need to maintain that same level of staffing there. Um, that, that is something that, uh, when I look at our administrators right now, uh, they are dealing with a lot of, a lot of, across the district, a lot of these learning recovery issues, as well as the social-emotional issues,
have uh, added to their plates. So uh, I, I did not recommend that, and the, and the board did not adopt a reduction. Um, with no reduction, was there a change in the makeup of the of the count associated with that scenario? Meaning, um, did it did you did a position change, even though there was no net change in count? It, not at Khan's meeting house, but in, in the one restructuring that we did was with the technology position for some savings with, with that. Going from I'm not sure I understood your question, Greg. Could you expand on that? Um, no, no net change, so no negative one in total administrator count, but was there a uh, role change, meaning uh, one type of one type of administrative responsibility role? Which almost invariably is an uplift in the role. Yeah, yeah okay, got it. Thanks. No, no, the, 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 Positions are the same as currently set. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. So, one second, Kim. I'm sorry. Do you want me to speak to them? When we had Con's meeting house separately, each building had a principal and assistant principal, mm -hmm. which we all felt was appropriate given the number of students and teachers. They've moved to one campus and maintained the number of people. To your question, there's one head principal and three assistants so that there's a structure that makes it easier to do business, but it's still, everything else remains the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sort of following <coughs> up on Cheryl's, and I, I do like that you're giving us some results, that's, that's really important. Um, I know there used to be statistics, and I don't know if there still is, on how many of our college-bound students graduate college after six years. Is, is that type of statistics still available? We that's can out there. We, we can get that. I think it'd be great to see that. Um, Good point. I was a little shocked by the increase in pre-K special ed identification from 35 to 60. That's a really big increase. And I'm curious, has there been a different methodology applied here? Um, it's just coincidence? It's pandemic. So I'll, I'll start. We have Catherine Matz here who can add. But the, again, coming out of the pandemic, students and being, being isolated, being uh, you know, in, a, in an environment that uh, had, had not been typical, we're seeing more needs present themselves and more students becoming identified. Catherine, do you want to add? I see you said it perfectly, oh. honestly. <laughs> I've been coached well. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Making me look good. Yes, um, we're also seeing increased um, referrals out of our birth to program, which is the state birth to three special education services it does fall under the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, but outside of public education. So referrals from that group have also increased significantly. So we're seeing pressure from both straight from families and also through that system. They're seeing more students requiring services and those services being more intense and complicated, requiring additional related services, speech, OT, PT, behavior support, um, ABA services, applied behavior analysis, etc. So we have you know, seen the same increase as every other district in the state. And th that identification, that, is that generally a process that takes place over a, a lengthy period of time within the semester? How much of it is initially identified the day the child first enters? Quentin, can you hear me, or would you like me to get a little closer to the mic? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading the signs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in terms of public education, the requirement of the district is once we receive what's called a referral, meaning we have been notified in some way that we believe or a parent believes or a staff member believes a child may have an educational disability, we have 45 school days from the receipt of referral until we have implemented services if appropriate. So it's a fairly quick turnaround that's roughly nine weeks um, and the entire evaluation, review of the reports and determination of services and plan have to be in place to start no later than the 45th school day from the receipt of referral. I'm just curious if most of those referrals or some portion of those referrals occur within the first two weeks or are they do they tend to show up? At the pre-K level, it really is ongoing throughout the school year. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. I, I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the do you have statistics showing how many students come off individualized learning plans as they transfer from one grade to the next? 
I don't have that number for you specifically, but the net between the students who are found eligible and the students who are exited from special education year over year, the net has been positive, meaning our number of identified students at any time has grown, not decreased. We are, as of today, I believe our number is 425, as compared to the numbers when this slideshow was developed was a total of about 408 students. Would it be fair to say that this kind of increase Hopefully it's pandemic related and maybe only lasts a year or two, but that it's going to have significant financial implications, not just for this budget year, for, but for future budget years as well. I would love to promise you <laughs> that we're going to plateau, but I honestly do not know. But it would be fair to say that we have seen a spike we'll, since we'll the pandemic. Costs, we'll see costs increasing in years in the future because we're, we have a lot more identified students at pre-K. I feel that's a fair assumption, yes. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank of you. Of course. Thank you for not throwing tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very important. I, mean, I took Kim's tomatoes away. <laughs> you're, you're I'm glad we're on opposite back. sides of the room. Yes, um, Catherine, as long as you're still standing, one of my questions is for you. I remember when the Board of Finance met with you uh, many months ago. There was one program that your special ed community was looking at to possibly take out of district students for um, tuition. It, we're not talking the Bridges program, it was a different program. How is that going now? Sure, that's our strides program. That no, pro not strides. Not it was strides. An, another. It was a different. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe sorry, I I'm maybe ILS. Well, we course. we may have tossed that around, but I no. believe it was strides, which no, is our strides. I'm familiar with. It okay. was a secondary position that you said you were possibly looking at that maybe one or two out of district students could come in. Yes. Yeah, so very likely, I was referring to our ILS programs, yes. which is um, we have in place K through 12 essentially. Okay. Um, at the high school, we still call it a life skills program, but it is essentially the same. And over time, we've built that continuum from kindergarten all the way up to grade 12, mm -hmm. at which point if students continue to require that level of support and they need transition services post high school um, graduation requirements, they go to strides, which you're also familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge right now with both strides and our ILS continuum in terms of bringing in students from other districts on a tuition basis, it's still very interesting to us. We would still like to do that if possible in the future. Our staffing shortages have made it so challenging to meet the needs of the students we already have in district and that are ours. We cannot in good conscience bring in additional students. We cannot fill our open positions. So it's not that we don't want to, it's that we cannot staff the students that we have consistently on a day-to-day -day basis and would not be appropriate for us to add students to those programs. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think, um, um, it's and not I realize that things can change, but I think the, the last situation was um, you did, you were looking at one particular child and you weren't sure, not you, but the community was not sure that that would be a fit for that child. So I think that was the issue as I recall it. But thank you, I just wanted to see where we were at with that. Sure, great memory. I think your memory's spot on for the yes. situation we were discussing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we would love to do that when we're fully staffed consistently day to day. Thank you. While I'm up here, anybody else? Any other questions for special ed? Okay, I'm gonna pass the baton thank back. I'm wondering how secure are we in the projections of the state funds that will be coming to us for this budget? I know like reimbursement. I'm, reimbursement. Yeah, the reimburses. I know that sometimes that number is not really written in stone until after we actually vote on a budget. And I'm wondering sometimes there's a two year and then it gets revised. What's what's our situation? Are we pretty confident in how much money we'll get from the state this year? Yes, we are. You, the grants we take are entitlement grants, and typically they come in actually a little bit more, not by a lot. So I, I'm not, not concerned about our entitlement grants. You haven't heard discussion of changing the formula and increasing the money for large towns and decreasing the money for small towns? So I've heard of these, yes, 
is going down slightly for the town share, which isn't, is not included in our operational budget. But on the other side of that, I've heard that special education excess costs grant may go from a reimbursement of 70% to 85%. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add to that? I guess for the town side. Um, so we have received governor's proposed budget, um, you know, which will be going to the legislature. And as usual, we will receive final numbers um, after, most likely after our referendum. But for the town overall, and governor's proposed budget includes um, ECS um, and access, uh, just ECS figure. And unfortunately, that number has gone down by about 200,000. So that impact of the governor's proposed budget is currently accounted for in the binder in the revenue section. Um, governmental revenue includes governor's proposed budget. That's 200,000 is, is, is accounted for, you're saying? Correct. Thank you. What about Sherman tuition? Uh, if, we, if we're going to have a new school come online, are we having more people interested? Is that number going up and is that reflected in here? No. Uh, actually, Sherman students, their current eighth grade, the large number of their students are actually going to Chicago. They're only sending us three. Okay. So, and we're actually in contract negotiation with them right now uh, mm -hmm. for our next contract, three year contract. So, we don't know if it's going to go up or down. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I'm holding that line. It's going, I mean, I would like to see it go up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Yes. Yes. So, what are the, I don't recall, I, I have a number in my head, but what is our present reimbursement from Sherman for student? It's around 15,000 a year. That's what I thought. 398,000, I think, is the, the, the total bill right now. I think we have about 26 students. Right. And do we have any idea where we're raising that based on our price per student? Right now we're in negotiations, so I don't, I'm not comfortable saying Yeah, no, yeah. no, then, then it's not talking about Yeah, it. yeah no. I, yeah. Our present price per student is much higher. Um, just you mean our, that out our, there. our per people expense? Per people, yes. Yeah, yes, it is much higher. Right. We are in line with the other, the other towns that they send their students to when it comes to tuition dollars. Could you be a little more specific? I know the number is up about 20,000. Oh, here. our free people is, I believe, 21,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but our, I, what I meant, what I was trying to say was what Sherman receives, you know, pays to other districts is in line. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, the 21,000 you were mentioning, that was, uh, that's not the number that would come from this budget. That's the, uh, Retrospective number. Correct. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, you started, you started the presentation, it was a nice presentation, thank you. Uh, with the, the term of academic growth, high quality instruction, and uh, healthy learning environment. And without going too deeply into the weeds, could you just give us a brief overview of how you actually measure those things? Uh, is academic growth, when we were seeing the charts, etc., was that largely based on, on standardized testing, or are there factors leading into how you're measuring that? So I'll start, and Julie, uh, Julie can also add. When we look at um, the academic growth at the top of the pyramid, and we look at um, you know the high quality instruction, certainly um, you know we, have, we 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 focus on the results, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, we also, uh, when we look at high quality instruction, we're we're looking at the trends and patterns that we see in the classrooms. <coughs> Right in terms of the implementation, how effective that is. Um, in terms of a healthy learning environment standpoint, we use surveys. We have a survey right now of high school students that we're going to be looking at to see uh, in terms of their uh, attitudes and behaviors. That's going to be helpful and it's going to inform future future programming. Um, so, uh, as I said in the presentation as well, in those areas when we look at the outcomes for students. Uh, uh, you, you know, graduation rates, uh, how are students, uh, you know, positioning self for, for college, are they taking advantage of our academic pathways that we've established at the high school? Um, you know, and again, we're, we're looking at some of the distinctions that we have with, with, with athletics and the arts and things of that nature. Yeah. And the graphs specifically for English language and math that we were shown. 
uh, comparing essentially last year to this year. Those, those, is that strictly a standardized test? Those are standardized. <clears throat> those come from the, the, uh, the, the smarter balance assessments in grades three through eight. Uh, we also have uh, results uh, every year in grade 11 for uh, ELA and, and math. There's also science standardized testing data, uh, not, not reflected here just in terms of the brevity of the, the, the presentation, but that's also another metric that we look at. And, and do we that's only tested in grades 5, 8, and, and 11. Do we still have dem demographic resource groups in, in the state? And if so, what one are we currently in? I'm going to have Julie answer this because she gave a thorough presentation last year on this. <laughs> so you're referring to the DIRS. Mm -hmm. um, while they probably still technically exist because no one ever came out and said they don't exist, they are no longer, they've never been updated and are not considered valid comparison groups. Um, towns have all shifted their wealth and size and all kinds of things. So we used to be DERG B when people talked about DERGs. Uh, the state of Connecticut um, was surprised to hear that boards of education are still talking about DERGs. They said they're not valid. So is there anything in your opinion that would be better for us to compare ourselves to other than simply the state average? So I'll give you two answers to that. I think the most important thing to compare ourselves to is ourself. Um, because it's about forward motion. And as you can see, our students are doing better than they did before, and we can continue that upward climb. Um, I asked the state the same question. There's a fellow in the assessment office who's an amazing statistician and a great resource, and um, he said, if you really need to compare yourself to other communities, look at the uh, percentage of free and reduced lunch and uh, district size. And so, I do have a list of roughly six towns. They're not local, they're not ones that we typically talk about, but who are very aligned with us in terms of their percent of um, financial wellness in the community as well as their size. We typically do better than those communities. But again, I think comparing to ourselves is the most important measure. Brookfield's not one of those, one of those towns? Nope. Interesting. Thank you. <coughs> Julie, can you send us that information on the other town? Uh, if sure. we don't have, we might already have it, okay. <laughs> but if we don't? Sure. All right. Thank you. I've got a, a capital question. I think maybe you may not need to wait for Phil, but <clears throat> when is that oil tank coming out of the ground? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And yeah. the, are the, the federal funds that are carrying over that 390000 can that help use to pay for bringing that oil tank out of the ground? So uh, we've applied the, those monies to the, the education operating budget, not the capital side. Okay. Uh, Kerry can speak to whether that would qualify or not uh, if we had chose to go in that direction. But, you know, that would just... If it can, it would. It, would, it, it can't. It can't. Okay. So, okay. so I won't even go to the next step. But, but uh, that needs to be taken out um, uh, by the end of 2024. So by the end of 2024, um, we have to have it. So it's either in this year's budget or next year's budget. Okay. The end of 2024 is that December or is that June? Is that a fiscal year end or? So I was just talking to Phil about this yesterday the other day and um, we are really going to try to push it to the next fiscal year Okay. right now because we're, we're in the process of getting really solid quotes and how much it's going to cost okay. and we're just we're working on that so it's in process okay how was that financed to yes to them or not mm -hmm. the, the last no, one we had was, was 360 i believe we had it we had yeah, it in the presentation yeah. like three, mm -hmm. three twenty. Just to make sure I understand, the 390000 is not going to cap and non, and it's also not going to payroll? That's it's right? not going to payroll. It's going towards uh, the, the non-payroll towards curriculum, technology, special ed uh, needs, and uh, as much of that non-recurring needs as possible. What would examples of that be? On the curriculum side, Julie? Uh, for using the ESSER funds? Yes. Hmm. And then uh, on the technology side, we're talking about things like software. Um, and on the special ed side, uh, we, we, I'll have Catherine speak to that, but Julie will talk to curriculum. 
So our curriculum budget has really two large buckets and then a lot of little things, but the two big drivers in the curriculum budget are professional learning and training for the adults and the textbooks and workbooks that we put in the hands of children. The difference this year to last year is largely because last year we took $100,000 out of that budget mm -hmm. um, and used ESSER funds. So this year's budget is actually not that different than last year's. However, um, some of the big drivers in there include um, when you're buying textbooks, you don't buy consistently every single year. We, had in the, we have in the budget for a math textbook. We need for next year a science uh, middle school resource. So depending on what you're replacing in any given cycle, it is a section of the budget that tends to bump up and down a lot. Um, I have a follow up on that. I, I knew about the 390,000, but in our packet, is that money spent? No, right? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. All right, I knew we have the 390000 coming in. What I need to know is in the, the budget uh, proposed allocation. Yeah, in yeah. the proposed budget, is that money already expended? That's what I need to know. The, the, the 390000 is applied to this FY24 budget. It is to bring down the increase on this okay. budget. It's allocated. That's what I need to know. Thank you. Yeah. The other capital question I have, it's just a request I'm sure to include it, is the replacement of the middle school roof. That's probably the biggest thing in your plan and a timeline. Yeah, it's, it's um, it, it, and I think it goes back to Cheryl wanting a comprehensive analysis. Yeah. I think that's something, you know, two boards will, really should discuss because a lot of the items have been moved down the line in the mm -hmm. capital plan. And a capital plan really cannot um, take on the, the roof itself. You might have to look at other means of, of funding that given how high the, the cost is. So if you're looking to fund a 10-year you know, capital improvement plan with a, with a certain number every year, it'd be very hard to fund it uh, you know, with something, let's say, pulling a number out of the air, 500,000 a year yeah. to try to you know, meet that need. Okay. You know, um, every superintendent and uh, business manager that we have handles the, um, I forget what the term is, but Wes often used to question this, the, uh, on your payroll, handle this different about um, the um, transfers. No, not the transfers, the uh, the 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 slip slippage between budgeting 100 percent of payroll versus what it's going to turn out to be. Turnover savings. What what is the name? Are you talking turnover savings? <laughs> yeah. Okay. How did you guys handle that? And, and I'm going to start by just framing this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll okay. get to your answer. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I asked of Carrie this this budget was that we put an additive section in the document that lays out where every position is located in each building, certified, non-certified, for example, how many counselors, how many teachers in those buildings in each department, so that we could be as transparent as possible. Show everyone where the staff are, and then be spot on with what um, the projected salary, because for all of our bargaining units right now, we know what the projected increase is. It's one of those years we're able to do that. We don't have any contract mm -hmm. negotiations at the moment. But um, one of the things we are looking very closely, I'm glad you asked this question, is a turnover savings. Each year, um, there has been uh, uh, in the budget $300,000 of anticipated turnover savings. Now, we're, we're not seeing that each year that, that we're uh, meeting that level of turnover, meaning someone at a higher salary leaves the district and someone at a lower salary comes in. What we're seeing is when we're trying to also replace staff, the pool of candidates out there is so slim and in certain positions, you know, you, you, you're, you're trying to put high quality teachers in front of students but they're not always beginning teachers. And so you may not have that savings or because you might have to, you might be getting people with eight, 10 years experience, which moves them along the column. So that's while this year we have 
$300,000 in turnover savings, we're concerned that we're already going to be in the hole to start the year because in, in this current year, in the last year, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we haven't quite made that level. Yes, that's correct. For fiscal year 22, we didn't hit that number. I mean, I know we, we faced a deficit uh, last year. So it does concern me. I've been assured by my predecessor that we will hit it. <laughs> so um, I, I <laughs> but it, it, it's concerning. And to I think to Ken's point, we do hire people at a much higher step often because the pool is so small. So it was, the challenges are a little bit different. But you also have positions that stay vacant longer because they're harder to fill. Correct. So that's part of, that is, I, I just wanted to know. But I will say, Cheryl, we, for, for day one, all of our certified staffing positions, they were filled. Oh, they were? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And okay. Because the board comments to like, Ken, there are any changes yeah, on the personnel gonna add a, report. An anecdotal on the personnel report. We've never seen the numbers this low in terms of turnover since okay. most of us have been yeah. on this and, board. So and, the, the, the superintendent and his team has been very effective in filling positions and people and retaining people. So you've accounted for 300000 That that's a, that's a challenge for you, it a, is, a goal. It's a challenge. That, it's a goal. you've got that in the budget already. Mm -hmm. We do. Okay, so yes, that's, we do. I think it's 286. The, the, the current, what, what used to happen is that we had a couple of superintendents ago, we'd have people who would budget for 100%. Right. And, and so yeah. then we would try and guess on the Board of Finance, what's the right number to remove from that? Uh, mm -hmm. And now, we, uh, with our last superintendent, at least, we had more transparency in that, and I'm glad to see that again. I just wanted to make sure we weren't going back to 100%. If I could just add, Cheryl. Yeah. Um, you know, I've looked, I've looked at other budgets in the area, mm -hmm. because this, th this question for me, you know, is a big one. I want to I mm -hmm. make sure we're um, not setting ourselves up. I've looked at uh, other districts that are larger than us, and I look at the number that's put in for turnover savings, and it's 50% of what we're putting in. Um, so it, it is something I'd like to have more conversation. It is already included as an offset in this okay. budget, so it, so it is there. All right. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up, um, currently there are no unfilled positions that were listed initially in the budget, or are there some? I, let, me, um, let me just uh, qualify. So uh, the one area we're really having problems in terms of staffing is with the, the paraprofessionals. Mm -hmm. So we have more need for paraprofessionals than we do have um, people out there who are interested in, in the positions. But in terms of the number that were budgeted last year, we've reached that number. We're, we're certainly, all the positions that were budgeted for, um, we've reached, but we, we've had had that additional need for paras, which we're trying to you know, we want to always maintain our obligation to uh, address the IEP goals and objectives, and we're just having to so you're trying to figure hire it out. Within, you're trying to hire within this current budget year as well as what you're projecting for, for the future. Yeah, so going back to my staffing plan, uh, the certified staffing plan is virtually the same budget to budget, but the paraprofessionals budget to budget an increase of 6.4 paras, which we currently have uh, the need for right now that we're, they're working to fill. They are working to fill. We're working to fill. Some of those so are filled. If, if you get lucky there, some of that, no, that, that 6.4 might go down? That wouldn't be turnover savings because we didn't budget for the 6.4 no, I'm, I'm, and I'm just, 23. I'm just saying if, if you wanted 6.4 in the upcoming budget, but if you were able to hire two of them during this I guess it's still the same cost either way. Okay. I mean, and, and you're not, you, it's not the, the bigger dollars, like when when uh, there was a shift between Pat and me, there was, with Rich and Karen. It would be the same they, amount they were, of money. Larger, there were larger dollars associated. So when the certified <laughs> staffing is where you would accumulate the turnover savings. It would, it would be the same amount of money, but ultimately it would show up as a smaller increase, percentage increase. Well, increased budget over budget. Yes. So those six positions weren't in the budget for this school year. So regardless if we get them filled or not, there's yes. still six more positions than in the 
But you're going to look like you had a, a lesser increase if you do get some of those filled. Okay, I follow that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the total you said was for 6.4 full time equivalent paras is still only 160000 because they're not, we don't pay paras very much money. Yeah. We're paying more than we used to. Yes, more than we used to. But <laughs> Cheryl, I do need to add one thing. I, I, I want to be completely transparent. Okay. Um, since that time of the 6.4, we've seen additional needs. Of, mm -hmm. We had, a, you know, just the other day, another student coming in. So uh, I, already unbudgeted. And, and we're trying, when we look at paras, and, and the team knows, I've challenged them, I need you to be as efficient as possible. Look at, can you use multiple paras for, for, for multiple student needs? Right. And um, so, uh, you know, but it, 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 there are fluctuations. We try to manage it within the, within the, the budget plan that we have. Okay, thank you. Can, uh, I'm going to give some questions, obviously, to Wes. What, I don't know if, you, if um, you can answer this right now, but on the math improvement, one thing I'd be interested in knowing is how much the Bridges program, K-5, to uh, added to that improvement. Because I'll start, and then yeah. Julie will add. Mm -hmm. uh, the professional development overall and coaching uh, that is a big piece that, that has been started before me, which has an impact. And, and curriculum and standards and the program is important too. Mm -hmm. Julie can talk about that. Sure. Thor, if I understand you're asking, is the use of bridges yeah, what we attribute? How much did that influence the graph? That's what I'm asking. How much did that she's, influence she's for a the impact? Right, so bridges. very little, because mm -hmm. we started a full implementation of bridges this fall. And the data that we've shared with you is based on the end of last school year's data. Mm -hmm. There is one component of Bridges called Number Corner, which really um, has the flavor of the whole program, which gets students talking about math, thinking mathematically, conceptually, um, being comfortable pulling numbers apart, putting them together, and truly good math. That practice started last year, so that segment of it no doubt impacted, and our preparation for the implementation where we developed staff and our focus through um, professional <coughs> development around high quality instruction influenced that, but the full Bridges program we won't see the impact of until we're having this conversation next year with the end of this school year's data. Okay, thank you. And I'll just to follow up, Julie, are we going to, maybe we already have it, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I saw it online or not. Are we going to get a full set of the standardized test scores so that we can see them in all areas throughout the district? I can bring anything you'd like. Just yeah, I, I, I would like to see all of them throughout the district. So what we've shared with you actually is a compilation. Um, the academic performance data combines grades 3 through 8 and 11 because the state chunks the SAT in with the SBAC for that piece. Growth data is only available three through eight because SAT is a one-time test, and growth data needs two data points. Mm -hmm. I think um, we I think we have a couple of reports from the yeah. fall that we can share that were presented mm -hmm. at the yes, Board of Education. We, I remember we um, I remember a year ago. Okay, I, I know we were asking for that kind of data. So any data that you have that shows um, statistical information would be helpful. You know, Thora, I, I don't know if you're all familiar with the NAEP test. Mm -hmm. It's like the nation's report card. And I really, I, I want to bring it up because I really want to bring that point home of how um, incredible this growth was. Because McKinsey did a report on the NAEP report. It's called COVID-19, Learning, Delay, and Recovery. Where do U.S. states stand? So according to the report, some two decades of progress have been wiped out. Average math scores for fourth and eighth grade, student, eighth grade students uh, in 2022 fell by five and eight points respectively compared with 2019 levels. The pandemic has erased more than 20 years of progress on NAEP assessments. Barring unforeseen disruptions, if student performance 
improves at rates similar to historical trends. Fourth grade students will not catch up to 2019 math levels until 2036. Now this is from McKinsey, a, a well-respected uh, company. And reading levels until 2044, while eighth, grade, eighth graders won't recover 2019 math levels until 2050. And I just bring that up to say what, what this district has accomplished by raising the levels post-pandemic and what we, was demonstrated here is phenomenal. And so I say that to say the things that have been put in place to do that, it wasn't by chance. This was strategic moves to bring coaching and support and, and, and remedial support is why we can talk about this. And I just want the, the Board of Finance members to really reflect on that as you, you know, discuss this budget we're presenting to you in terms of what impact reductions would have to the progress we're making, the momentum we're making, the return on investment, as Cheryl um, pointed out earlier, and how important it is to look at return on investment because how are taxpayers' dollars being spent? And I can honestly say the way they've been spent here and what's happening is showing up in student achievement, student performance, and, and progress that we are making. That, that's all. Beth, could you, for, could you forward us a link to that article? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, this is a, a, I will admit, a personal bugaboo of mine. <laughs> uh, I'm concerned when I hear that the town taxpayers are going to be, or maybe already have, ponied up tax dollars for the replacement of the turf fields because there was a promise made to the town at that time that tax dollars would never have to pay for that replacement. There was a field fees committee created to assure that the fees were matching the projected cost in the future. And also, frankly, to make Park and Rec and the Board of Ed more trusting one of, of one another because up until that time, there had been very little trust between the two as to how income was coming in and where it was going to. So I, I'm just curious what the current projected surplus or deficit is, is there for the Field Peace Committee for the years, let's say, 27, 28, and 30, 31, five and 10 years out, because they were doing a 10-year study and, and you could see, you know, it would build, it would build, it would build, it would dwindle. One year it might go slightly negative, then it would build back up again. I don't know if that's occurring anymore. I'm curious, when did that committee last project replacement costs for artificial, artificial turf fields? And when was the last time the DOE raised any of the fees listed on the fee schedule for field usage? Uh, I, I would just like to have that information because I'm concerned about what's, that, that's maybe kind of slipped by the wayside. Um, and I, I can, I can give you that yeah. in an email or something. So, so can I, I think I think um, we can come back. At yeah, I don't expect that today. And, and provide that information. Is that fair? And one other thing, and this is just because I'm concerned, because frankly, I always thought both of these building projects were probably undersized for the future. So I'm wondering what what the design student capacity for each of the two skilled and school building project was at the time they were approved by the voters and what the design capacity for the two buildings are now as built. And one other personal bugaboo. <laughs> Can you just go back? You said the sure. student capacity I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I, we, we had to tell the state what the capacity of those buildings were going to be and then they based our reimbursement on that and if we made it too big we would not get reimbursed, et cetera, et cetera. So and you want the capacity Currently, Cur the when, when it was first approved by the taxpayers, and what it will be as actually built. I don't know if those are the same numbers or not. High school is 716, and I believe we're at 708. That's what we should I'm sorry, what? We used 716 students for the high school for a grant application. I have to go back to on Okay, and do we know what it was when taxpayers approved it? 716 was what it was on the... And that's what it is as built? I believe we're at 708. I, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, yeah, no thanks. I, yeah, I don't, okay. expect, I don't expect it today. <laughs> and the one last one, I would just love to know <coughs> total cost for all curricular and extracurricular athletic programs and separately for curricular and extracurricular arts programs. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think we service our art students as well as we should have. I think that goes back agree. 
to a time when I was on the board and I was chair of the board and I'm guilty of not having enforced it then. And I know it's difficult to enforce and I know athletic parents are much more organized than arts parents, uh, which, uh, which kind That's of has true. some different pressures applied to the board. But I would just love to know those. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, okay. since you're already taking notes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and also, if, if there's we questions that come up. Well, this one's an easy one. Um, I would like to know um, what you think about the if you have the data, I'm assuming that you do, but I would like to know how many AP courses there are in surrounding towns, um, particularly um, Brookfield, Danbury, Bethel, and Milford, and Newtown. Well, there's also, I mean, if you look at the Well, I guess so those are. How many, how many people get uh, AP scores on the testing of four and five? Mm -hmm. Well, That's you the might want that. Right? I just want to know the number of AP, yeah. AP How do we compare um, courses. To the, well, I think that's generally true for most of the of the data. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I was delighted to see the the, uh, the percentage increase data for all the districts in the area. I, I thought that was very useful. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see a similar thing. The one that caught my eye was we had we had seven people in the music program who were regionally recognized. Mm -hmm. And my reaction to that is, well, I'm delighted that we had seven, maybe. Uh, but what? How about the other schools in the area? I mean, is seven really low? Is seven high? Is it average? I, I, I have no clue. And mm -hmm. I would like to have a clue. That's a good point, Dave. We need comparisons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's true for pretty much all the the, the performance metrics. Yeah. How are we doing? Yeah, it would be, I think it would be good to, for our own AP classes to see any statistics you have on that, on the score, that would be helpful. At some point in the past, students, some students might have been discouraged by administrators to take AP classes. There was sometimes discussion of whether there should be something that causes the ability to take an AP class. Is it still available to anyone who wants it, even though you might counsel them and say, this might mm -hmm. be not what you really need right now? And also long ago, there was discussion about colleges being in a competition to accept the results of AP and to give credit for them just in order to be able to compete with one another for those particular students. Is that still kind of what's going on? Are colleges, are colleges as acceptance, as accepting of AP so classes AP and course. giving credit for them as they as they were ten years ago? So, if students take AP courses, at the end of the course they take a test that scored mm -hmm. one through five. Yep. Some colleges don't care; they won't give you anything. Yep. Some only if you have a five. Some a four and a five, um, and that's a variable. Yep. Um, one thing we've done a lot of um, shifting towards is that ECE courses, early college experience courses, grant you a three credit transcript as long as you are in a C or better in the class. That's accepted at every college because it is a transcripted college credit. So we have, in addition to the AP courses that Dr. Carl presented, many, many ECE classes. We recognize those as having significant financial gains for students because mm. those are credits. Some students graduate with 18 college credits yep. and can graduate a semester early because they've taken those courses that fulfill our requirements as well as receive college credits. So if we were uh, picking a horse to ride, we're riding both, but we love ECE. And then the trend on colleges giving credit for AP seems to be kind of steady, nothing much changing there. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big change in the colleges is that they're going towards um, score optional yeah. for the SATs. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. th that's the that's the trend in terms of colleges. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe uh, students entering college, students entering a trade school, could we get maybe a couple years previous data on that? Because I'm I'm kind of wondering, just personally curious, if the uh, the great discussions of student debt that we've seen in the last few years has been altering that in any way. So the, the, the statistics I showed, you want to see that over a three-year? Yeah, if we could see the last couple of years of that. So if, um, uh, 
if you go to that, the, yeah, I, I, it's actually embedded in that the presentation oh, okay. link that I had. Oh, great. Okay. There's about 20 slides, which you, know, you might want to take a look at. Okay. Uh, there is a slide that shows um, three bars for, for uh, the last three years. For, Thank you. Australia. Yeah, Quentin, if you were to go there, there you go. Class of 2022, if it's still alive. And then if you scroll, uh, you can just scroll down. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, that one right there. Post high school plans, takes the four year, two year trade school. Military. So not a lot of difference? No, no. Okay, thanks. But you might find this resource. Interesting difference in the military. Mm -hmm. What I'm learning here yeah. is that a lot of the presentations we do in the fall for the, for the board on results and things like that, to have up on our website where you know, you know where it is too, because you could, you'll be able to see these things, and, and, and I'll try to link that to our website. Mm -hmm. okay. Plus, there are a couple of things I would just like to mention before, because I can see we're starting to run out of, well, we're past time, but um, one thing that we haven't mentioned at all, as we've had the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education, is that we are sitting here looking at a top sheet. Uh, which is which includes all the budgets and the medical and uh, twelve million dollars of bonding, with a mill rate increase for next year of thirteen point one five percent. So mm -hmm. you hear that the board of selectmen budget has barely changed; that the education budget is at a you know five something. But I just want the public to be aware mm -hmm. that there are lots of other pieces in this budget. The additional $12 million of bonding is mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the uh, what we have to do for medical is huge. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at, to start off with, 13.15%. Um, so when you tell us, put budgets out as presented, um, just bear in mind that we're going to have to do some work somehow pairing because I, I, I as a board of finance member I can't put 13 percent tax mm -hmm. increase out to the public um, so um, I, I just want people to be aware of that and we and we do have some we have bond premium that we mm -hmm. can use mm -hmm. we have um, some uh, we, we have some things that we can look at, but to get 13.15% down to a number that the community might be able to accept and vote on is going to be challenging for us. So uh, I just want everybody to know that. The other thing, this is just a personal thing, but um, uh, over the last few years, and many of you know this, but I've become a low vision challenged person. So um, whether it's Board of Slackman, Board of Education, our own Board of Finance, whenever you bring presentations like this to the room and expect me to be able to read them, I can't. Uh, so if you um, bring a hard copy. At least one hard copy. Um, to, if, if I need to pay attention mm -hmm. during the presentation, mm -hmm. that would be much appreciated. These things that are on websites, I can go home and look at and catch myself up on. But I'm just asking for a reasonable accommodation as a low vision person. Um, if you could help me with that, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Or a PDF, and you can expand it on the iPad. Right. So when I'm at home uh, doing the Zoom meetings, I'm yeah. always, well, I, I usually get it by email. I'm able to. Yeah. Expanded and so forth. So that's all. Thank you. I just want to dovetail on one thing that Cheryl brought up. Um, maybe not, but I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of discussion of our medical reserve fund. And that benefits our town tremendously. Uh, so that that's going to be a real key piece. And that's for all of our employees' benefits, everybody. Town and, town and uh, board of Town and board of mm -hmm. Huge, huge thing. No one wants to worry about medical right now. And it's an obligation. 
Yes, We've it's an obligation to our employees. It's a promise. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. yes. Kind of a general question, and it's because I'm guilty of not having paid much attention to the last two budget seasons because, frankly, I was no longer in office and I was taking a breather. Um, <laughs> was there much discussion in the last two budget seasons about how various state and federal funding would be putting large holes into upcoming budgets? Yes. We're seeing the result of that now. And was yes. there I'm was there any sure. suggestion? There was, was there any as it warranted, was there any suggestion? Was there any suggestion as what might what yes, might be done to, to to remediate that? That was brought up a number of times during the last budget season uh, because already we saw in the last budget season uh, it was actually in writing that some of the grant positions were going to be kept. And I just will speak for myself. As a member of the Board of Finance, I knew that that was a very not good situation. So that was brought up an, uh, actually ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. yeah, I got tired of saying it. They got tired of hearing it. You did bring it up. All right, so yes. that, that, was a, that was an issue. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. And one part of that, Mark? And, and one part of that was uh, additional positions that were funded in the ESSA funds yeah. for the school. I believe it was yeah. coaching positions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad that it made an impact, but that is a major push of that five percent of the uh, budget for payroll. So, so you, you have this chicken and egg thing. Yep. Right. You don't, you don't get results like that by magic. The, the, the resources were there, the, the needs were there. No one has ever experienced it. No one alive today has ever experienced a pandemic. And we had to apply these resources in the most effective way to meet the needs of kids. And that's, that's showing up. So you're right, it, it, you know, it does create a current challenge. But, you know, it's the responsibility of the superintendent and his board to make sure the needs of our kids are met. And this is evidence of that. I, I hear you. It's tough. So, Pat, I didn't notice, but those graphs showing the, the improvement over a year ago in current, or were those, so was that a fifth grader then compared to what that student did in sixth grade, or was that two different classes of fifth graders being compared to themselves? I'm sorry, Kim, I missed the first so part. So if we're looking at if we're looking at the results from one year to the next, right. we can either look at this oh, year's okay. fifth yeah. grade and next year's fifth grade, or we can look at this year last year's fifth grade and what happened to them in sixth grade. And which of those are we doing with those so graphs? We look, we, we look at growth. We look at both, but we look at growth, right? So when you when you look at how do how do students or groups of students perform? You know, as fifth graders, and then again as sixth right. graders, did you see growth? We also look year to year a fifth grade cohort versus another fifth grade cohort. That tells us more about um, perhaps uh, you know how particular interventions, curriculum, things of that nature are working. Um, but you know, we want to we want to see that growth year to year. So the growth graph. <laughs> the growth so graphs that we looked at today so were they the cohort or were they were they fifth grade to fifth grade sixth grade to sixth grade? Go ahead. Uh, do you want the slides? Or? Um, if you want, sure. The growth data is kids against themselves. It's their percentage, how much gain kids made from the end of one grade to the next. So for this data, it's kids in grades four through eight looking at their grades three through seven and the growth they made in between. So this, I think the way you're describing it, you would consider cohort. So you're, fo you're following the student, not, right. not basing right. it on cohort. Okay, so thank you. So that's cohort. I'm and glad. then, Quinn, <laughs> can you see the achievement for a second? Go back. The yeah. achievement is oh. grades right there. three through eight plus 11, everybody one year and everybody the next year. So. Largely, it's the same kids, except for the slight shift. And when you start to aggregate the kids in that large of a group, it becomes much more valid, even though people have stepped forward and there's a few one grade level difference at each end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? 
questions? Would, wouldn't we expect some natural growth as they move from one as they move from one year to the next? Wouldn't we expect growth each year as they move forward? So we do expect growth. What the growth chart, Quentin, could you please? Next one, Quentin. Yep. Typically, if you don't change your practices, kids make the same amount of growth every year. What this is showing is that the kids made more growth than they had previously. In other words, the instructional practices shifted such that they were making more growth in a year than they had before. So the 2018-19, just saw, I, I'm, I'm dumb. So no, the 2018-19, the blue, that's to. actually showing what those students, what their progress was from that previous year, 17-18. So the blue. Right, the growth scores in 18-19 reflect their 17-18 data. Okay. And their 1819 data, now and the amount of gain. Now I understand. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Mark, to your earlier point, coaches were not part of the ESSER funds. So, what positions were you know, those ESSER funds? Because I know that we were talking about 10 positions last year. Okay. Teachers. Quint Teachers. Uh, Quentin, just, uh, I'm going to give you a slide number that's mm -hmm. from a previous deck. Okay. Uh, it's slide 30. Quentin, if you go to slide 35. Here we go. Mark, is this what you're referring to? Yes. The ESSER the, um, the funds were applied to these 10 positions. And if you look on the left, um, th these weren't uh, new positions. These were positions that, for IEP goals and objectives, we, you know, just as a general comment, mm -hmm. the ESSER funds were reduced to just used to reduce the overall um, uh, spending sure. plan that we had, right? Mm -hmm. These were needs that we had previously continued to have in terms of special education. Kinder, I mean, y you know, kindergarten teacher, third grade teacher, th that's all, you know, we use enrollment to determine how many sections mm -hmm. we had. So funds applied there. The interventionists for learning recovery, um, obviously coming out of the pandemic. The, the STEAM teacher, um, again, uh, you know, in the middle school, we have um, a set of unified arts classes. We decided in this budget to apply funds to that particular position. Now, if that position wasn't there, you'd still need uh, some other course because those students have to be someplace when they're not in English, math, social studies, and science. So I guess what I'm trying to say are these funds were used to just reduce the overall impact of the budget last year and the needs that were had, not 10 additional positions to the budget, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes sense here. Anything else? Are we done? Are we had enough. Yes. I'll, I'll probably have some more questions Wednesday along the lines of what I asked of the selectmen, just in terms of some historical data. But I'm I'm not ready to present that at all yet. We have a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Need a second. Second. Okay. Take a vote by saying aye. 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 Opposed. We're adjourned. Thank you.